Holy crap. People persist in doubting the evidence. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. If the game is rigged, change the game. You're listening to Jimmy Church fade to black. Game changer, game changer, game changer, game changer. The game changer radio network. And now, your host, the captain of conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Yeah. All right, man. Monday. How you doing? How you doing? All right, let's go. This is Fade to Black. It is Monday. Uh, always great to get back in the chair. Let me tell you. Hanging out with all of you. <sighs> Fade to Black. The spoke radio for the masses today is monday june 8th 159 days into the new year 206 days left man right right at the tipping point another month we're halfway through wow already as always we are live from the city of angel studios right here in downtown burbank california in the bunker COA Vapor, makers of the Fade to Black E Juice. It's called Fader Loops. Just go to the COA banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. It's right there. Use the promo code Jimmy for the Fader Not Special. What is up, everybody? I'd like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR and the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. I'm your oh so humble host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? Tonight's the night we've all been waiting for. Oh, waited my whole life for tonight's show. You've heard me tell the story many times on the air. I'll tell it I'll tell it again tonight when we bring when we bring on Betty. That's right. Tonight we do have Betty Andreessen Luca with us and her husband Bob Luca. Close encounters of the fourth kind. With two of the most important investigated and documented cases in UFO history. Betty Andreessen changed my life. Without Betty, without Betty, I'm not sitting in this chair. Think about that. Think about that. Oh, man. I I just can't tell you how excited I am. It's Christmas morning here. Is it Christmas morning or Christmas Eve? Betty and Bob aren't here yet. So I guess it's Christmas Eve. Tomorrow night, the one and only Robert Perala is with us. And fired up about that, too. And, uh, I mean, just what a great week we have lined up. And then, of course, Wednesday is going to be the first of a few, the first of a few Hangar One specials. With cast and crew right here on Fade to Black. And that'll be Wednesday. This Wednesday, we're going to have John Ventry on. Uh, We've got uh, Jeremy Ray on. We've got, uh, oh, let's see, who else? Uh, Lee Lee Spiegel is going to be with us. 
How cool is that? And uh, and then the week after, uh, I've got some other cool. You know, I don't want to give it away, but uh, the week after that, uh, we're gonna have a producer on uh, from uh, Hangar One. We're gonna have one of the writers on with us, and uh, a couple of more investigators, and uh, and you know, cast, cast, the cast of Hangar One. And we're doing this because it's the last three weeks of the season, which ends on the twenty sixth. And I, I it, somehow it got away from us. The whole season is gone. It, it's gone. It, it's 12 episodes. And we blinked. And we're at the end of the season. And we meant to do what we're doing now, you know, somewhere before. And it just it just got away from us. It got away from us. But, uh, you know, I, I got a hold of uh, everybody that we needed to. And every, uh, you know, the producers of the show and Jan and... And uh, oh, also uh, this Thursday, uh, uh, Clifford Clift will be joining us. So we've got uh, on Hangar One uh, for Wednesday night. So yeah, man, great week lined up here on Fade to Black. And uh, it's just going to be a fun ride. Kicking it off tonight, of course, with Betty Andreessen. And I'm just fired up, fired up over the weekend. We went to go see Eddie Izzard at the Hollywood Bowl. We went uh, Saturday night, and uh, I gotta say, even though he was half in drag, they were saying he, you know, he doesn't he doesn't dress as a as a woman anymore. He's he's gonna come out straight, and he did. He came out in a suit, but he snuck on some, you know, like six inch pumps. <laughs> he still. He, he was probably wearing a thong. I don't know. But on the outside, he had a black and white uh, suit on. He came out like uh, the Avengers. It was pretty cool. And uh, so we had a great night under the stars, friends, family. One of the uh, things that they haven't let go of at the Hollywood Bowl, and if you ever get a chance, I think the Hollywood Bowl should be a bucket list thing for everybody, for just the entire planet. It's such a unique venue. But – one of the things that they still do there and they haven't let go of uh, the tradition at the Hollywood Bowl is is wine, cheese, picnic basket. And you go and you just kick it and uh, drink your wine and eat your food and hang out uh, for a couple of hours before showtime. You're right there in the Hollywood Hills. And we did all of that. We had a box, a box, you know, for four, not a box, a picnic box, <laughs> a box that you sit in. We had a box for four right there in front. Well, not in in front, but you know, in front where the boxes are, and uh, and we did it, man. Uh, tables, wine, cheese, food. Oh man, it was just a wonderful, perfect day. And to top it off, Eddie Izzard for three straight hours under the stars, sold out, packed, standing room only, and uh, what a great time! And. I don't want to give it away for all of you out there that uh, are going to go see Eddie Izzard on this tour, but uh, he does not disappoint. It's just your classic Eddie Izzard history lesson. And I learned a few things too that night. Oh man. What was it? Charles uh, uh, Richard, the Lionheart. I didn't know this apparently. And I'm going to go with Eddie Izzard on this Richard, the Lionheart who fought Saladin didn't speak English. Dude spoke French. <laughs> I don't remember that in the movie. <laughs> I don't remember that in the movie. Dude spoke French. I didn't know that. Eddie, man. Oh, oh just, just too much. I didn't. Um, you kind of know and remember a few things as he's going on, but it's just so, so funny. But uh, that, you know, England for 300 years spoke French. And I did, I, anyway, enough Eddie Izzard. He was just too much. Oh, so anyway, uh, whoa, whoa, uh, uh, tweet out the the selfie that Eddie Izzard, Eddie Izzard took. So Eddie comes out, I think it was, was it at the beginning of the show he does the selfie? I can't even remember. Or was that what, one of his encores? Well, anyway, he comes out and, and takes a selfie. And so we stand up. We're right there, man. I'm standing right in back of him, and he pops this selfie. And you've got to see it. It's great. Yeah, we made it. We made it into Eddie Izzard's selfie. And now you can't tell that it's us, but, it, you know, because it gets a little fuzzy. 
But uh, yeah, that's it's right there, um, and and we are standing. So it's not that clear. I'm not. I'm just saying we did. If you squint a little bit and use your imagination, uh, we're we're right there. But uh, yeah, we made it into the Eddie Izzard selfie. All right, so there you go. That's uh, that's it. Let's uh, let's get this show cracking. We got a lot of news to get to. A lot of stuff I'm uh, just fired up about tonight. I have been uh, looking forward to this for quite a while. Let's get this show cracking. Oh, hey, whoa, whoa, um, Riri, whoa, whoa, Riri, <laughs> Rita, uh, could you tweet out the uh, uh, Michael Avon Oming uh, Powers pick that uh, he did? Uh, could you tweet that out? Oh, look, there it is. Here's the Eddie Izzard. Follow us on Twitter, by the way, at J Church Radio. That's you, what you want to do. And uh, I'm retweeting it now. There's the Eddie Izzard pick. Now, everybody, as you're looking at the pick, look right to the right of his forehead, and you see the aisle. Okay? Right there, level with his hair. That that corner section right there, that's our box. Right there, right next, right to the right of his head. Right there. So there you go. Use your imagination. The four of us are right there. Right there, man. Those people in the front row, they got it going on. And we were like, a, I don't know, 15 people back. So, you know, right there, right to the right of his head is we were on that aisle. Right there. We were on the aisle. So there we are. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. He took like 10 selfies, by the way. <laughs> he, took like, he popped them off. All right, that's that. Um, uh, Rita, if you could uh, do the uh, Michael Va- uh, um, Michael Avon Oming Powers pick. He tweeted it out today, or uh, I think it was on Facebook, and he started it yesterday. And he, uh, as you know, he's the artist behind uh, so many great com- mice Templar and uh, Powers, which is uh, a Sony. Uh, uh, animation slash action series that is that is on. Uh, I think it's on. Man, what what is it? Is it Xbox? Is it no? It's PlayStation. It's on the Sony PlayStation channel, and uh, and so Powers is there now. Well, anyway, yesterday he he Facebooked out this new illustration that he's working on, and it was the fade to black T shirt. And I was like, holy crap! What's he doing? And I was like, okay, so one of your characters. I thought, how cool is that? One of your characters is wearing a fade to black shirt. Wow. Okay, this is great. And then he responded back. He said, no, it it, it, it might be you. Ha, ha, ha. LOL. Ha, ha, ha. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. And uh, here it is. Uh, Rita just uh, tweeted it out. There it is for everybody to see. I just retweeted. Check out this pick. Now, there we are, and we're fighting or we're running from this is what Michael said in his post, uh, from a jousting uh I don't know, jousting jousting somebody just annihilating uh the city, right? And everybody's running, ah, running. And then look who was running at the front of the crowd. The first people out running scared. It's me and Mike Barra right there in front and there i am in my fade of black shirt and i gotta say it's a it's a pretty uh it's a it's a it, i'm he made me look better looking than i am a person so thank you michael for that but but look at look at mike barra with his seahawks shirt running behind me so the two the the two biggest wusses in the crowd man we're not saving women and children no, we're we're bailing. But anyway, thank you, Michael. What an honor uh, to uh, make it into Powers. And uh, there it is. So I just uh, retweeted that out. And and again, you know, just just totally humbling. Thank you, thank you, Michael. You're one of the most talented artists out there. And um, you know, and I I don't know if you hear it enough, but man, 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 are you a talented, talented guy? I look at that stuff. I, you know, I was an artist my entire life, and the one thing I could never do was comic book stuff. I mean, I, I just bailed. I was a technical guy. All right, let's get to it really quick. I'm running behind because I'm babbling. I'm babbling today. Bonnie Tyler. That's right, the Bonnie Tyler. 
totally clips of the heart, Bonnie Tyler is 64 years old. Jerry Stiller, Ben Stiller's dad, is 88. Had one of the uh, one of the great roles ever in Zoolander, by the way. Nancy Sinatra, Nancy, these boots are made for walking Sinatra, is 75. Nick Rhodes, keyboard player extraordinaire that changed him and uh, what's his name from the cars. Those two guys, man, changed keyboards in rock and roll forever. Nick Rhodes of Duran Duran is only 53. Her dead guy's birthday today is a moment of silence. Joan Rivers, 1933 to 2014, died last year at the age of 81. Actress, director, comedian, funny. Oscar red carpet interviewer. She won a daytime Emmy. She launched and hosted the late show starring Joan Rivers. And then on August 28, 2014, experienced serious complications and stopped breathing while undergoing what was scheduled as a minor throat procedure at an outpatient clinic. She was resuscitated an hour later. Rivers was transferred to the hospital to a hospital and later put on life support. She died on September 4th at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, having never awoken from a medically induced coma. Sad day that was, wasn't it? Happy birthday, Joan Rivers. All right, let's get out of here. Let's get to the news that you know nothing about and a couple of other things. Let's have some fun. Tonight, Betty Andreessen and Bob Luca are with us. It will be a Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind show with two of the most important investigated and documented cases in UFO history tonight on Fade to Black. Tomorrow night, Robert Barala is with us. Wednesday is the Hangar One special. I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three-letter. So, seriously. Give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S dot com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Kletsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fader Knots rock. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. I am your oh-so-humble host, Jimmy Church. 
And I got to tell you, I know what you're wondering right now. How did I get through the weekend? Eddie Izzard, make it through working the last 14 days straight. All of these shows, everything that we do around here. How does, how does it happen? It happens with Power Bites. How did I make it to the show today? These guys, right here, Power Bites. No joke. Take them every single day. I, I don't know what I would do without them. Power Bites are a multi vitamin mineral formula designed to naturally boost your energy this multivitamin goes right to work fast i've got it right here in the studio right next to the console right here staring at me power vites the green turtle bay vitamin company are dedicated nutritionists and they have been producing power vites for over 20 years right here in the united states of america that's right. I'm going to have a, an American flag right behind me real soon for live video with these guys right here. They produce high-quality nutritional dietary and health supplements in small, fresh, potent batches, and they ship direct to you. To order, go to their website. It's simple, energywave.com. That's energywave.com, and use promo code KGRA and get free shipping on your order. Just call 1-800-TURTLE-5. That's 1-800-T-U-R-T-L-E-5. Live operators are standing by. 1-800-887-8535. Power of Ites. I do, and so should you. Go Bagley Tepe. All right, let's go. On this day in history, in 1949, the FBI reports names of Hollywood figures as communist, including Frederick March, John Garfield, Paul Mooney, the original Scarface, Paul Mooney, and Edward G. Robinson. Unbelievable part of American history, wasn't it? And on this day in 1984, Ghostbusters was released. 1984, really? Was it that long ago? God, it just doesn't seem like it. What is that? That's 31 years? Holy crap. All right, Fader Facts. Let's go. Man, I'm out of time. I don't have time for the news. I did it again. And I just feel like, ah, what do I do to get to the news? I got to stop talking. Then I, then I, then there's no news if I don't talk, right? It doesn't make any sense. Fader facts. The slowest mammal on planet Earth is the tree sloth. It moves at six feet per minute. Harrison Ford has a spider named after him. Yeah, it's called the Harrison Ford Eye. I'm not kidding. <laughs> he does. Here's another fader fact. Most of the dust underneath your bed is actually your own dead skin. Here's another one. Solar storms can knock out satellites, turning them into satellites that are dead but still move. The official word? Zombie stats, or zombie sats stats, same thing, right? That's a fader fact. Here's another one. About 2,200 pounds of circuit boards, 2,200 pounds of circuit boards contain 40 to 800 times the amount of gold normally mined from 2,200 pounds of ore. One last fader fact for you this is a good one, too. The Japanese beer company Sapporo has brewed beer from barley grown on the space station. And those are your fader facts today. Do you feel smarter? Do you feel smarter? I know you do. Here's all the news you know nothing about. I'm going to do this rapid fire. It will have a new name, this section of the show. Rapid fire news that you know nothing about. The New York Housing Authority is so worried about their workers being targeted by the police that they want them to wear bright orange vests. I have seen the pictures. It's crazy. They say it will make them more visible, but others say it's to stop them from being shot by trigger-happy cops. The move comes after law enforcement officer fatally shot a maintenance crew worker who was going about his everyday job. The man... Uh, a father of two, his name is Akai Gurley, was unarmed in a poorly lit stairwell of a Brooklyn housing complex when he accidentally startled a police officer. Yeah, Peter Liang, 
who opened fire by mistake and shot him dead. The U.S. Army's website was taken offline today, and a Twitter account claiming to be the group calling itself the Syrian Electronic Army alleged it had hacked the site. The Syrian Electronic Army is a network of hackers who back embattled Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. That's right. Ground control teams finally hope to get confirmation early today, in other words, uh, moving into tomorrow, that the experimental spacecraft, that solar sail thing, is back into operational running order. That's right. Engineers working on the privately funded light sail project wrestled with the computer software glitch and a troubled battery before the tiny spacecraft's motor began unfurling the thin 340-foot square sail on Sunday afternoon yesterday. Two days after the launch, light sail, which is about the size of a loaf of bread, fell silent, the victim of a computer software glitch. After more than a week, a stray cosmic ray hit and rebooted light sails computers, and engineers proceeded with deployment of the spacecraft's solar panel. Then another problem, believed to be the battery, halted operations again, but everything is back and running because of a stray cosmic ray. Incredible. A Michigan judge banned a woman from owning a cell phone Wednesday last week as part of her probation after she killed a cyclist while driving distracted with a cell phone. Mitzi Nelson pleaded no contest in the death of Jill Bilich. Nelson struck Bilich, who was wearing a helmet and reflective clothing, as she rode her bike last fall. Police said Nelson was distracted by her cell phone at that time. Nelson will not be allowed to own a cell phone during her two-year probation. What else did she get hit with? 90 days of her six-month jail sentence she has to serve. She has to speak to 20 drivers' education classes about the dangers of distracted driving and perform 150 hours of community service and thousands of dollars in restitutions and fees for the death of someone. Seems a little light in the loafers. To me, actor Leonard Nimoy has been given a singular honor. There's only one. That's right. The asteroid 4864 Nimoy has been named after him. The asteroid is roughly 10 kilometers across and is in the main belt between Mars and Jupiter. It orbits the sun once every 3.9 years. Ah, Let's see here. Let me let me get one more quick one in. Police in rural northwestern Germany rushed out to track down a reported mob of up to 15 people armed with knives and sticks. Instead, they found a group of asparagus harvesters. Police in the town of Ludwiglust said a man called their emergency number Saturday to report having seen 10 to 15 people armed with knives and sticks on a local road. Within minutes, six police cars showed up. And officers quickly discovered, however, that the group was asparagus harvesters walking along the road with the tools that they take to work every day. They were on a lunch break. And that's it. That's part of all the no <laughs> news that you know nothing about. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Betty Andreessen and Bob Luca are with us. I've been waiting for this for many, many years. It's going to be a great night here on Fade to Block. Stay with us. Do not touch that mouse. When we come back, Betty Luca Andreessen, Betty Andreessen Luca, and Bob Luca will be right here on Fade to Block. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Hi, this is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Today, everybody, the Fader Dots and Planet Earth is vaping. And I'm very proud to announce our very own e-juice. 
When we were approached by City of Angels Vapor about Faded Black E-Juice, I wanted to make sure that it was the very best and that the flavors were something that I could create myself. And we did just that. Introducing Fade to Black Fader Loops. This will take you right back to Saturday morning cartoons and your favorite bowl of Fruity Loopy cereal. Just click on the banner or go to www.coavapor.com. Enter the promo code Jimmy for the Fader Not Special. That's www.coavapor.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're of the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Attention all fade or not. Studio Dome has a special deal on their SD1 Bluetooth speaker. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on their banner, enter the promo code Jimmy, and you get $40 off and free shipping on the SD-1. It's voice activated, comes with a USB antenna, cables, and a carry bag. Never listen to your phone, tablet, or laptop speakers ever again. It's the only way to listen to Fade to Black. That's JimmyChurchRadio.com, Studio Dome banner, promo code Jimmy, go back Lee Tepe. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planets. I am your oh-so-humble host, Jimmy Church. And I'll tell you, this is a fact. I've told the story many times. Uh, 30 years ago, my life changed when I read The Andreessen Affair. I will tell the story again tonight, but it did. It did. And without that book, I wouldn't be sitting in this chair today. In 1967, Betty Luca was told by alien beings that much time would pass before her generation would believe her. Now, today, 40 years later, she is right here on Fade to Black to, to share the story with myself and you and, of course, her husband, Bob. In 1978, Bob Luca was told by the elders, you do not die. While, while Betty experienced the alien beings firsthand, Bob endured the government's harassment and extreme invasion into their private lives. FBI agents visited their home, their place of employment, to question co-workers on his whereabouts. The couple also suspected that their phones were being tapped, and often they found themselves being followed by unidentified black cars. The Andreessen Affair by Raymond Fowler is the it's, it's one of the most documented, investigated, close encounters of the fourth kind stories in ufology. And tonight, I am honored, so humbly, to have with us Betty Andreessen Luca and Bob Luca. Hello, you two. How are you? Hello. Hello. We're Thank fine. you. Thank you for having us on. It is such an honor. Uh, and so, look, before, before I just gloat like a little kid, I'm just going to say... <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm going to start off with this because, Bob, I told you the story earlier today. Betty, you and I didn't have a chance to talk. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Bob told you the story. But I'll say this. Did. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and this is what happened. In 1984, I come to Los Angeles and I rented a house in, uh, in Pasadena with some other folks. And, and the house was empty. We had no furniture, nothing. I had my guitar and a suitcase. I had no bed, no pillow, no blanket. My first night in the house. And and I'm walking around the empty rooms and I'm just happy. 
you know, it's a new house. You know that feeling, right? And and, I, and I'm walking around. I go into one of the empty bedrooms. There was five bedrooms, and uh, uh, three of them were empty, I think. Uh, well, without anybody living there yet. And I walk into uh, one of the empty rooms, and on the shelf, I for some reason, I was compelled to open up the closet door. And I open it up, and it's a white closet, nothing in there. And then I see on the top shelf to my left, all the way in the back, two books. And I was like, wow, that's strange. The house is empty. The only thing in this house is these two books. <laughs> so I pull them down, and it's uh, an Andreessen affair and an interrupted journey uh, with Betty and Barney Hill. And I pulled them down, and I did have a TV, no radio, but my entertainment is right there in my hands. And so I started with Andreessen affair. And and this is the thing, and I said this to Bob. I've said it so many times on the air. Uh it scared the crap out of me. Oh, my. <laughs> it, it did. I'm not the only one. Millions, you know. But, and and the reason why, Betty, it wasn't that it's not a horror story. It's not It's not no. meant for that. It's right. just the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's detailed. It was the level of detail. And you're reading it. And, I mean, you get drawn in. And I did. And I read the book with one eye. And I kept the other eye on the bedroom window, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. And, and, and listen, all kidding aside, I want to thank you for, for uh, uh, doing that book. It must have been tough. And I've read it so many times since then. But it, 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 it's, it's just you're exposing yourself to the world. Exactly. Yes. And, but you did do that. And without that, uh, I wouldn't be here today on this microphone speaking to you and Bob. So, again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for writing that book. I'm excited. It's great. It's like Christmas morning for me here, Betty. Oh, so, God bless you. So thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I don't even know where to start because I know so much about your story, and mm -hmm. I've studied it over the years. But this show, and one of the beautiful things about this show, uh, you two, is that um, we have a whole new group of listeners out there that that uh, um, that you know a next generation of mm -hmm. of researchers and people that are seeking the truth that that have probably heard about your story but maybe don't know it firsthand and mm -hmm. so and I know you've told the story uh, so many times but indulge me let's right. let let's go back in time we have two segments that we kind of have to do tonight. We have the Betty story, and then we have your um, uh, uh, how do I want to say this? Your your life with Bob, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's like two right. little things. So let's let's start there and let's paint that picture, if you will, and then we'll just kind of move forward. And then uh, then we have the Bob era. We have the Betty and Bob era. <laughs> so we'll do that. Is that okay? Can we do it that, that way? Sounds fine to me. What about you, hon? Absolutely. Okay, let's do it that way. Let's start. Uh, I know that you had uh, three three distinct uh, events in your life before uh, things took off with the family in 1967. Mm -hmm. So let's start there when you were a little, little girl. Uh, where okay. were you? How How old were you? And what happened the first time around? Okay, I was living in Leominster, Massachusetts, and I was seven years old, and I was out in the front yard. My brother had built a little fort, like, and I was sitting there waiting for my friend Davey to come over to play dolls. So I was sitting there eating some crackers, and all of a sudden, a uh, bee, it, it sounded like a bumblebee, came into the hut and was going round and round my head, and suddenly it turned into a white ball of light. And it struck me right on the forehead. It, it sort of bit me right between the eyes on the forehead. And when that happened, I went down and out. And at that particular time, uh, I heard a, a voice of many voices speaking together. And I heard them say, the wee little one is coming along fine. Now, what they meant, I don't know. Uh, I was too young to realize, but I do remember that those words of him saying, the wee little one's coming along fine, and that I was going to be very happy very soon. Well, after that, the next thing I knew, I was sitting up and I was uh, crying, feeling on my forehead to see what had happened. Dee Dee came into the hut, and I told her I got bit by 
a bumblebee. And she checked my head. There was no bump and no mark there. So that's how it was at seven years old of what I recall. And then uh, after that time, we, my parents had moved from Lemonster. They bought a house in Westminster. It was an old farm. And we moved there, and I was uh, about 12 years old at the time when the second experience happened. And what had happened, I was sort of a tomboy. I just loved the area. I was always in the woods, always hunting, always fishing, always picking flowers or whatever. And the thing was uh, that I went into one of the sheds that uh, was with the house that my parents had bought, and it was a bunch of old tools, uh, and there was a pair of um, these um, traps, yeah, to set for animals. And being a tomboy, I thought, oh, I remember seeing a big hole up in the woods there next to the uh, mountain laurel. I'm going to put that trap there and see what I can catch. So I put a trap up there, and the next morning went to school, and I was so excited all through the day think, thinking, oh, I've caught something. And so when I got home, I rushed up into the back, and I had to go up a hill, the first hill of the area that I lived at, and there were uh, chicken coops there. And I reached down by the chicken coop, and I picked up a couple of stones because I was going into the woods, and every time I went into the woods, I either carried a big stick or I carried some stones just in case I ran into any kind of trouble. And at that point, I went over to the area where I had put the trap inside a big, huge hole there, and I looked, and I could see that the trap was gone. The, The wood was down that it was tied to and everything. And I looked down into the hole, and as I did, I saw this gray thing coming out of the hole. And it looked sort of like um, a bee's nest, like a hornet's nest, those big gray uh, nests that had wrinkly gray skin. Mm -hmm. It was coming out of the hole, and I'm, I'm stunned, wondering what in the world is going on. The next thing I realized, there was a small being standing in front of me. And at that particular point, I stepped back because I was a little fearful of what it looked like. It had the gray skin. It was uh, short. Uh, it had large, dark eyes. It was dressed in a brown suit, and it had a an emblem on its chest with some lights there or buttons like lights that were colorful. And I stepped back, and I threw the stones at the uh, bomb, wondering what in the world it was, thinking that it can't be an animal, but whatever it was, I was afraid of what it was. Threw the stones, and they stopped in midair and fell to the earth. At that particular point, the being that was standing there touched something on his chest, a button or something, and I saw a light zip out. And again, it hit me in the forehead right between the eyes, like, and down I went. And at that particular point, I heard a voice. It was like a multiple voice speaking. And they were checking me. And the thing was, all of a sudden, I heard them say, well, she's got another year. And that's all. That's what I had recalled. And at that point, after uh, when I was finished there, they, they must have wiped it from my memory because then the next time I had the experience was the following year. And that was at 13 years old. And, and I, I have to ask, I have so many questions that I've wanted to ask you for so long. And one of them is this, and I've never heard anybody else ask you this question, but um, when, when they were, when they said, uh, you know, you've got another year, do you think that that ha- might have something to do with the implant in that you, uh, later on, you, you know, you talk about the needle, um, in your nose and we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But yes, but, that's exactly but, what it was. Do uh, you think that's what it was? Because, yeah. Um, you never, um, in the book and in other interviews, you always talk about seeing it, but not knowing when, uh, that that was done. And for them to make that comment, 
mm-hmm. you know, she's got another year. Maybe that implant was incubating a little more. I don't know, but <laughs> but do you think that that had something to do with the implant? Oh, definitely, because it, at 13 years old, uh, I had gotten up early in the morning. I was going out, to, uh, going up the back hill to see how the plants were doing. My father had a garden and blackberries up there. And as I walked up the stairs next to the barn, and I looked off to the right-hand side, my attention was drawn there because I saw a bright light, and, and it looked like the moon. And I'm thinking, what is the moon doing out there at this time of day? Well, the, the moon seemed to get larger and come closer and closer to me until I was engulfed in white light. And evidently, at that time, I was picked up. And when I was taken into this room, there were these small beings dressed in white. They had the large heads, the black eyes, and that's about all I could see was their heads or their hands moving because uh, their suits were bright white as well as the room lit up so much. And it was at that particular time, Jimmy, that uh, I was taken to an area and that is when uh, they gave me an implant. I was very shook up. During the uh, regressive hypnosis session to find out how it all happened and everything, uh, it was very frightening to me all over again. Uh, what it was was that they had uh, examined me and everything, and they went by my eyes, and they um, were opening at my eyes, uh, and and they took my eyeball out. It was just like laying there, and I could see it uh, through my regressive hypnosis that I was going through, and, and it was so frightening. And they went inside. Uh, somehow they kept me so I was calm, but it was frightening to have this happening to me. And it was at that point they inserted a needle into my right eye socket. And that uh, was very fearful but, the, fearful, but the thing was, is they could lay their hand on my forehead and take away a great deal of the pain. So that throughout every examination I've had, thank God they have that, so that that didn't trouble me as much as I thought it would. I mean, I still went through some certain amount of pain, but not anything like I imagine I could have gone through. But it was at that particular time that I received an implant. And after they had put my eyeball back into my head, uh, then it would be uh, years later, in 1967, is when they would look for that implant. When uh, when you had your encounters at uh, you know your first three, those beings, uh, d- did they did they ever say or did you have the feeling later on in life that they were the same you know the same exact guys or was it another group that was coming? Because obviously they were following you and staying with you uh, throughout yeah. your childhood. Uh, was it was it the exact same, or was it a different you know well, a different group? Uh, the thing is, <clears throat> the first uh, time when I was seven years old, all I heard was a multiple voice, right? The bee sting, and then at uh, twelve years old, of course, I was taken aboard. I call it a moon craft because I saw it like a moon, and then suddenly it was bright white light, and I was inside this room. Right, <laughs> And they took me into another room at a different time, and uh, they took out the eyeball, and they placed their hand on my forehead to take away a great deal of the pain. That's when I received the implant, or an implant, and more than one, actually, I have to say, because um, there were some others that were given to me. But it would be in 1967 that the information would come out is when... I was again picked up, and that's when they withdrew one of those implants out of my left nostril. Yeah, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, Let, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, one question that I do have. Here you are now, uh, this is uh, 2015, and we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, time in between the events now. Uh, if If you had a choice going back, 
Would you do it all over again? Would, do you have any issues or are you cool with it? Would you, uh, you know, knowing in advance what, what you were about to go through, would you do it? Well, I don't think I would do it on my own, but evidently I was chosen to have to do this. Right. Um, but as far as me to say, okay, I'll do it, <laughs> it, wouldn't be, <laughs> it wouldn't be the case. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> I don't want people to fear uh, the beings because the particular ones I've been involved with, Jimmy, I really think they are angelic. I know they don't sound angelic the way they look and everything, but who are we to say what angels are supposed to look like or sure. spirits are supposed to look like? You know, God, I mean, he's created everything. What are we to say? Well, no, God, I don't want you to use those type <laughs> because they scare me. Right. You know? so, well, I suppose, um, so you're saying that you wouldn't do it voluntarily, but you wouldn't put up a fight either because you know that in, in the end it's a positive experience. Right. I, well, I was kind of controlled in a way, too, so that the pain, you know, I think it was actually fear that was mostly there that made me once in a while feel a little of the pain because they kind of tried to take away that pain every time they put their hand on my forehead. Right. And uh, and there, <clears throat> there's one aspect to the book that does uh, put the, uh, the the frightening spin on it is that it was completely out of your control. Yes, it's, exactly. it, You were not going to get out of the situation. Right. It, it was not in your control, and, right. and, and nobody likes to lose control. Yes. And, and that, yes. Was, that, that to me was the frightening aspect. Did mm -hmm. you feel like they were uh, at any point trying to comfort you and calm you down, or was it just, you know what, they were going about their business and your emotions were really not their concern. Right. It, 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 they weren't uh, too concerned about my <laughs> emotional stability there it, because I don't think they would have put me through it all if they really knew how my feelings were going on at that particular time. You know, each time that I was taken, uh, it was just so strange, everything happening, you know. And, uh, in 1967, when I was told that I was chosen to show the world, I realized, well, there's something I have to do that I've been given for me to do, and, you know, you just have to take it. That's all there is to it. And I'm he, getting goosebumps now. Yeah. Is, <laughs> isn't that great? Isn't that great? Well, Not uh, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, we're going to be up against a break in, in a few short minutes. So what I would like for you to do is, uh, set up the evening of 1967. Uh, your whole family is at the house. Uh, mm -hmm. your stepdad is there. It's your stepdad, right? Oh, no. That's your father. My, well, my your, father. Your fa I don't know why I was thinking stepdad, but, um, so your family's there. Your father's there. Uh, how many brothers and sisters? You had a whole... I had Seven children. Seven. That just rocks. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. so everybody is there, and mm -hmm. uh, so set up that except evening. For, except for my husband, who had had an accident and was in the hospital. That's right. So uh, yeah, let, let's set that up, and then we'll go into okay. a break, and then uh, we'll pick up from there. So what was the weather like outside? What were you guys doing? Who was well, in what part of the house, and, and what was going on? Okay. Can you want me to begin now? Yes, right okay. now, now. <laughs> All right. All right. What had happened first was my uh, my husband, my first husband, had had a car accident. He was in the hospital, was in bad shape and everything. So, of course, I had seven children, and uh, my mother and father thought, well, maybe I need help. So they came to stay with me. It was evening. We had finished supper and dishes and everything, and the television was on. The kids were watching the show and everything. My mother and father were in the living room there, and I was standing by just, uh, you know, seeing everything that was going on. And uh, what happened was the, the show that the kids were watching suddenly went off the air. The, the power went off, and all of a sudden it was a reddish-orange light 
uh, flashing and pulsating through the pantry window, through the kitchen, into the living room. Well, I stood up, and my, my father stood up as well, and we're thinking, oh, it must be the police or the fire department out there. I wonder what happened. Without me realizing it, my father rushed ahead of me, and he went into the kitchen first, went over into the pantry area, and the half of the pantry was open, and half had a, the other half had a wall there, and there was a window in the front, and then there was a small window where the reddish-orange light was coming through. Well, evidently my father had gone right to that window, but I was not aware of it. So I went out into the kitchen thinking, well, i got to see what's going on, if it's a police or, or a fire going on or what. And as I got into the kitchen, all of a sudden, something very strange happened. It was amazing. There were five beings that came right through the thick wooden kitchen door standing before me. And I'm wondering, I'm getting a little bit of goosebumps in my forehead right now, reliving, (laughs) I'm sorry. But anyways, here they were standing, and they were dressed in these blue uniforms, had belts and a sash across their chest, but they were, they had large heads, gray-skinned, big black eyes. And they're standing there before me, and I'm wondering what is going on. I became a little fearful at that time, and my mind went immediately to the Word of God where it says, entertain the strangers, for it may be angels unaware. And I'm thinking, you know, who are these uh, beings, you know? Oh, is this when you decided to cook them dinner? It was at that time they had placed in my mind a uh, message through mental telepathy. And I, that's what I thought. Oh, they want some food uh, <laughs> in the fire, you know. So I went sure. to the refrigerator, got some meat in the frying pan, and I put it on the stove, and it was sizzling away. I imagine they were wondering, what in the world is this woman doing? Is she out of her mind? Sure. But anyways, I'm I'm frying this meat, and they're telling me in my mind, no, 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 that isn't what we want, you know. Uh, and so anyways, I pulled it off the stove, and they said, we want knowledge tried by fire. So somehow my message got wrong or got, uh, you know, jumbled up, and I'm thinking, well, they want some meat, cut, uh, you know, cooked on the fire. And uh, so I'm wondering, knowledge tried by fire, the only thing I could think of was the Bible. And I had a Bible on the end table in the living room. And so we went into the living room. There was the being and three of the beings that came into the living room with me. And I reached down, and when I did, I looked over uh, at the couch, and my mother and the children are all sitting there as if they're in a state of suspended animation. Were they, were they, um, and this is a, a crucial time for me in the book too as well, were they completely motionless, like staring and, and uh, just completely oblivious to, the, yes. to their surroundings? They weren't moving at all? Yes, exactly. Exactly. They were placed in that kind of a state where, you know, they weren't aware of anything that was going on. They were just sitting there lifeless like. And your oldest daughter, uh, what was her name? Rebecca, Becky. Uh, yeah, Becky. Uh, and she had her own event. What? what uh, was Becky also motionless at this point, too? Yes, she was, yeah. What happened was I picked up the Bible, and I passed it to the leader. He said his name was Krasga. And he reached out his hand, and I could see the three fingers on his hand. He only had three fingers uh, for his hands. He had the Bible in his hand, and he took his other hand, and he waved it over the Bible, and he, it He had like three other smaller uh, books appear, and I, not I, he passed them to each one that was standing beside him, each one of the beings. They held them in their hands, and I could see the pages flip by. There was no print on it at all, just bright white light, and it seemed as if they were consuming whatever was on those pages through their eyes. It was strange. And then after that, he... Uh, put the Bible down, and he passed me a thin blue book. And at that time, he could see I was worried about my family uh, in that state of uh, suspended animation. And he had my daughter 
stand up, my daughter Becky, stand up beside the couch there. And she could not move, but she was watching. And she saw the being give me a thin blue book. Let's stop. And, let's stop right there. That's a good spot. The thin okay. blue book. That's a that's a excellent place to stop. Let's t- uh, let's take a quick break tonight on Fade to Black. Betty Andreessen Luca and her husband Bob are with us for this evening. A very special show. I'm your host Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the Planet. Stay right there. Betty and Bob will be right okay. back. out here we listen to jimmy church you're listening to fade to black always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk jimmy church with fade to black kgra radio.com hey everybody what's up jimmy church of fade to black and check this out The 2015 MUFON Symposium will be held this September 24th through the 27th in beautiful downtown Irvine, California. Expanding ufology, opening new doors in academia, industry, and media. Former Defense Minister of Canada Paul Hellyer will be there in person. Former CNN news anchor Cheryl Jones, TV news journalist Jaime Moussan, and MUFON's chief photo analyst Mark D'Antonio. They're just a few of the growing list of names for the 2015 event. It's September 24th through the 27th at the beautiful Hotel Irvine. Get your tickets today at MUFONSymposium.com. That's MUFONSymposium.com. Go back, Lee Tepe. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, a deep right center. Back goes Lewis to the wall, and it's out of here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you and Hillary for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. Tonight, a very special evening here on Fade to Black. We have Betty Andreessen Luca and her husband, Bob Luca, with us uh, for the duration. Betty, before the break, uh, we started talking about the Blue Book. I want to back up a couple of minutes before that happened. And your dad, I believe it was your dad, had described yeah. them when they were coming down the hill mm-hmm. uh, to the house as hopping. Yeah. And I always found that intriguing over the years. Can you, can you maybe uh, 
Well, he thought that they were children, you know, dressed in costumes and coming toward the house. And uh, what happened after when all of this information came out, I said, Daddy, uh, uh, you remember that. Would you please tell the investigators what you recall? And he didn't want to do that, you know, because he was afraid of his Social Security would be taken away from him from the government or something for him to be saying such a thing. And I said, well, I need support, Daddy. You know what happened? You saw you saw them yourself at a at, Actually, he was the first to see them because uh, when he rushed over into the pantry area, that's what he saw was the smaller beings in there hopping down the hill and dressed in the uniforms and everything like that. Yeah, he didn't say a whole lot. As a matter of fact, that was probably one of the only statements he did make, but it was a significant one about Mm -hmm. their actions. And I I just, it was, again, it was just kind of a, a strange way, you know, he didn't say that they floated. He didn't say that they walked. Uh, He said that they hopped. Right. And I just found that so interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I appreciated him uh, speaking with the investigators and letting them know exactly what he saw, you know, because uh, I mean, it was a strange thing that I went through and, and we all went through and, you know, they, the investigators wanted to know every detail that had happened. And, and of course, it was support for what I saw and also what Becky saw, because during that time that Becky was taken out of suspended animation briefly, she couldn't move about, her head could move in her eyes and she could see during that exchange of books where... Um, Uh, he gave me a thin blue book and he says that I would be allowed to keep it for 10 days. I was to study as much as I could of it, look through it and try and grasp as much as possible. And I think, uh, I think probably even the government is still wanting to know, Hey, what did she see in that book? You know, because we've had a few problems there. Well, you know, I want to know what you saw in that book. (laughs) Uh, to be honest with you, let's um uh there was also uh they said that you could keep the book for 10 days hey, but right, my right. memory says that you only kept it for nine they came back and right, got it at nine. exactly you're what, right what was the reason for that well it was because my daughter came to me three days later and she's afraid and she says mommy i remember some strange uh, being people being in our house and uh you know i wrote, i knew right then and there that she had seen the exchange of books the thin blue book given to me and i said Shh, don't say anything i don't want your brothers and sisters getting afraid or and everything i'll show you what i'm not supposed to show you but i'm going to show you what it was what the book was so i took her into my bedroom i had put the booklet up in on uh, the closet on the shelf i took it out of the shelf we, i sat on the bed and she stood there and i held the book out i didn't open the pages uh, for her at that time she just looked at it and she pre- uh, pressed her hand on top of the cover of that book and then when she took her hand away, there were all sparkles all over her hands. And what's so strange to me is now Becky can uh, write their strange language. And, She's and, able to just write it out, you know. And you kept, uh, and, um, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere with this right now. When huh? you, the book was in the closet up on the shelf, yeah. was it on the left side or the right side? It was. You know, right now, I don't remember. It was up on top of the shelf that was there. Uh, And then after uh, nine days, it was gone. I would take it out every day. So I could have had it on the right at one time and on the left at another. So it's kind of hard to recall that. uh, Because uh, remember, when I found the copy of the Idrisen Affair, it was in a closet up on the shelf, up on the uh, left. And I just thought that was kind of strange. Yeah, yeah, synchronicity. Yeah, kind of weird. <laughs> kind of weird. I, how thick? Um, I've always imagined it almost like a magazine. Uh, how thin, no. How thin no. or thick was it? It was very small and maybe about three and a half inches long and uh, I'd say about three inches wide. It wasn't very big. 
like a yeah, passport, I, like a passport or something? Uh, well, I've never seen a passport, but anyway, like a a pocket a book. large wallet. Yes, a large yes. wallet. Yeah. Interesting. And how many pages do you remember? Uh, well, there was uh, the first few pages were like light, and then there was um, very thin pages to it, and there were drawings and writings on it, and every day when the kids were at school, I wouldn't do it when the kids were home, I would just sit there and, and look at it and try and, you know, memorize it and look at some of the writings and the pictures, and uh, that's a that's about it. Then I would put it back when it was time for me to get my work done or the children to come home from school and put it back into the closet. And then uh, during that last day, on, on the ninth day, uh, it had gone. And I think they were probably upset with me a little bit that I had shown Becky. But I wanted to make her feel better. I, my daughter was really fearful of what she remembered seeing. Sure. And But I didn't want her telling her brothers and sisters to get them afraid, you know. And uh, so I just told her that it's in the Lord's hands. It's Jesus is with us not to be afraid, you know, because right. uh, nothing can happen unless the the spirit wants it to happen. So, did you know, you, God is involved in it all. Did you, um, did you recognize anything in the book? In, in other words, did any of it make any yeah. sense to you? Yeah, it, uh, there were some things that looked like what was in aboard the craft. Uh, you know, it's been such a long time now to try and draw them into my head again. Uh, it's kind of hard to think of it, but yeah, there were different things that I was supposed to learn about it. I don't know what it was. I think it was my spirit that was absorbing whatever it was that I was supposed to learn. Right, right. And whatever happened to that Bible? Did you get it back? <laughs> no, Becky and, and Becky says, "Mom, I think that was my Bible." Because <laughs> the, <laughs> the thing was that when we moved there, the children all uh, went to uh, the, the church up on the street at the street uh, street here. I wasn't able to go because I had so much to do at home. But the children all uh, went to the church, and they gave each one of my children a Bible when they first got there. And hers was missing. She could not find it no matter where she looked for it. So I thought, well, maybe she's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> Maybe that was why I was allowed to even let her see the thin blue book. And she received uh, the ability to write the strange language. Well, you know, Becky has always got that going for, you know, Maya Bible is uh, in Zeta Reticuli, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's had a UFO experiences as well. I me? know, they and have. I've I've read I've read her accounts, and yeah. uh, and I would like to actually talk about that at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and th now, now this is this is uh, some Jimmy questions, uh, okay. <laughs> if you don't mind. When you for when they first. Uh, you know, like came through the walls, vaporized through the, the wood and the doors. Sure. Sure. At, yeah. at that point, uh, did you ever come to the conclusion, uh, I mean, immediately, okay, we're not dealing with somebody from Earth here. This is, these are not humans. These are not from right. Earth. Uh, and, and, and did you come to that conclusion? And, and were you scared? Yeah, I, I I was strange because I was scared when it first came, they first came in, but scripture telling me uh, it may be angels, and then I felt a peace come over me. Right. You know, so I felt better about it. I mean, and then you know you you think in your mind, well, who am I to say what angels are supposed to look like? Even though you get pictures of the wings and a beautiful person there and everything, uh, you know, God makes many things. We just have to look at life itself and see the differences that are all around us and did, what has been made. Did your dad have the same view? I know that if, if I was at my daughter's house and my grandchildren are there and something like this is going down, I'm ready to defend the fort, if you know what I mean. 
<laughs> right. Well, that's why I think he rushed out and wondering what was going on, but was surprised to see what happened. And I think they must have put him in a state of suspended animation at that time as well. Yeah, they probably saw him about ready to. Uh... <laughs> yeah, do something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, now what? What happened next? Now that now they're all there, uh, your children are in the, the suspended state, um, and and I'm assuming your father is too. And uh, so take us through that. What happens next? Okay. Well, after uh, this was uh, before I showed Becky uh, the the book, the thin blue book, because it was about three days later that I showed Becky the book. But at that point, when uh, my family was left there and I was taken out of the house into the backyard, and I'm standing there, and there's a craft on the hill there, and uh, it's, we're standing there in front of the craft. And the leader raised his hand, and um, and when he did, he made uh, the bottom of that craft like it was transparent. I could see the inner workings of the lower part of the craft. And uh, there was uh, these big, huge crystal balls that had these armatures, metal armatures that came down that were long, and then on the top was another crystal-like ball. And then it had two, on the side, it had two arms that came out and held a uh, crystal-like wheel. And around that area was a tube that was all around. And uh, at one point, you know, they told me that they uh, used what they used in there, and one of it was mercury and some gel. Uh, matter of fact... I drew what I could remember, and Bob has put it on the uh, fa our Facebook, and uh, uh, as much as I could recall and remember about the craft, what it looked like for the lower pot. Uh, After that, uh, he put his hand down, and the craft became metal again, and we went into the craft. The door opened. We went into the craft. I stood there for quite a while. The others went wherever they had to go, and then they came back, and they took me up into an upper room. And uh, I was way up in an upper room for a period of time, and there was like a, a long uh, rectangular box, and it had these things that came out to the side. It's, it's hard to explain, you know. That's why I... Uh, being an amateur artist, I thought I've got to I've got to draw what I've seen. I can't explain it through word alone. And there was also something like a, a camera that came out in that upper room and was doing something. There were different things that happened when we went back down and out. I had seen. Um, it's kind of hard to explain all those little details, but anyways, I was taken down and taken into a lower room. And it was at that point that they were going to uh, remove that implant, one of the implants that I had been given at a young age of 13. Did you have a, uh, any problems breathing? You know, what did it smell like? Was it musty? Was it humid? Was it strange? No. Uh, anything like that at all that you can uh, remember? No. It, it, it seemed very... You know, your breath could really breathe real well there, uh, all except for when I get nervous or something. Then, then I felt as if I held my breath a little bit, but uh, it wasn't too bad in that way that I can recall now. What about the beings themselves, uh, Betty? Did they smell? No, no, they didn't. They okay. wore these blue suits, tight-fitted blue suits, and they had like boots on or something. And uh, at first, I think when I was in the uh, room where they were going to be taking out or put in, uh, taking out the imp one of the implants, they had white gloves on, uh, and that was odd because yeah, they, yeah, all yeah. my other experiences I had, I don't recall them having white gloves on at all. Only that one time. And what it was is um, they were, first of all, I had to be cleansed, however, before I went into this room where they were going to take the, the device out of me, uh, the, the implant. And uh, what they did was they put a needle into my navel. They were checking me for procreation. And the uh, Glasgow said there was something missing because they had this roll of, 
cloth or whatever it was, and they were looking at it as if something was not right. And I had had a hysterectomy. That's why something was missing. And I always thought that was an interesting comment for him to make. And did you did you necessarily understand uh, what he meant, or were you maybe well, jumped the to the conclusion? Well, the only thing, unless unless uh, he, I had a uh, because I did have um, I did have uh, fetus uh, when I went for the hysterectomy. I didn't even realize it. Oh, there was a fetus there, and it was removed. That's interesting. Uh-huh. And yeah. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to be revealing both Bob's and my story of everything, and we're going to be wide open. We're, we're, we've done a book now because I have seen the one again, and it was more personal because it, it, it you'll see that in the information that uh, I was given something. But... Uh, we have done a book. We're waiting to see if it uh, will be published by the book company that has done the uh, the Andreas Sphere again, um, and we're calling it uh, "Lifting the Veil." And there'll be bits and pieces of the different experiences I've had and Bob has had, and then go into things that people don't even know about us, and then the new experience, and also some things that we have had to deal with in life that. Uh, deal with the government and so forth and being followed in black helicopters and the whole bit. And that, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to force you to share tonight some of those experiences with well, the men in black. The thing is, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 I don't know if the, the publisher will be happy over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can just tell him it was Jimmy. I was out of control. The guy has a way of sucking this stuff out of us. Well, it's happened a little bit. A couple of the things have have crept out because of <laughs> other people uh, speaking about it, you know. And so, and I tell Bob, hey, we can't keep keep, keep giving away all that information. People won't be interested in finding out what happened to us. You know? yeah, well, if it is anything like uh, the the first book, I mean, Raymond. Oh. You see, yeah, but, the the way that Raymond... Yeah, uh, he's excellent. Oh, he's a, man, man, man. writer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, well, it's Bob and I putting it together. What happened, Jimmy, was uh, I, I had uh, an experience again with the one, and I uh, wrote down everything that had happened. I sent it to Ray, but he says there's only about two chapters there, you know, and, and I think after five books, I think he was... <laughs> had enough of it, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and he has a wonderful way of expressing himself and, and knowing so much knowledge about what is going on that that, that is not going to be uh, like in our book. It'll be telling what our life is like, what we've gone through, bits and pieces of the experiences and the new experience and things with the government and different things like that will be in this book. So, and it's, we're not we're not authors, so you, whoever reads it is going to have to take it like it is. It's just raw <laughs> if it, data. Well, see, that if it is if it if it is put down the the way that you're speaking to us now and the audience, it, it's 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 excellent. So I'm sure it's oh, going to be you. great. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you. Now let's uh, let, let's get uh, okay. So back to um, the the cleansing. And and when they uh, they they extracted, let, let's get to that part uh, really quick okay. because and the reason why um, there's a moment when you look at what's at the end of the needle and you describe it, and so yeah. I want I want you to share that with us and and share that with me. So okay, so they uh, they're cleansing you. What happens next? Well, I, I'm on the table where they're examining me, and um, the leader. Plasgar took a needle and he put his hand on my forehead to take away the pain, but he thrust it into my left nostril. And I could feel it going in and, and then he pulled it out. And when he did, I could see a little BB like device on the end of that needle with little pickers like in it. And evidently, that was one of the implants that uh, I had received earlier. And then after that, of course, then uh, he checked me for procreation, 
uh, and a, another needle went into my stomach, and I could feel it moving around. And, and he looked, uh, you know, seemed astonished, and he said, something's missing. They were looking at the roll of material they had there. I evidently they could tell. Now, I don't know if uh, it's because I had no um, womb there or, or what, uh, that they knew something was missing. But then again, as I said, uh, the hysterectomy was, um, it was a fetus there. Was this the first case of uh, a description of an implant like this? I don't know. I didn't know very much about UFO, uh, you know, things happening. Uh, I don't really know. Yeah, uh, it, it I seems was kind to... of kept away. I don't really know a lot of the people's cases. That's right. why, right. you know, Ray Fowler said, now, you know, you don't look into anything or anything. You just tell what happened, and that's it. And that's what I did. Um, uh, the event from 1967, when did, when were you regressed the first time? Uh, oh boy, dates are terrible with me because I had so much going on in my life. It was almost, uh, you know, impossible to keep up with the times and everything. I was being, uh, brought down, uh, to, uh, to the doctor's office to be, to go through regressive hypnosis. And then when I come home, uh, I was left open at one time. I'd be sweeping the floor and all of a sudden, wow, it hit me. What was going on? I could see it in my mind of what I went through at that time. Uh, Yes, uh, 77. That sounds about right. Thank you, Bob. (laughs) From the back row, from the back row, it's Bob. And... (laughs) And, and and I only say that because at that time, uh, 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 through the regression, uh, they must have been astonished to hear report. You know, the first report of I don't I I don't know if before then and certainly before 1967, um, if if there were any reports of anything like this in any other abductions. And I don't think I don't think it 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 it, it, it was out there. And that was. One of the parts of the book for me that was, um, it was, uh, it was shocking. It was a revelation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know. I wouldn't have known one way or another. I was too involved with seven children. <laughs> I'm going through some, some tough times anyway, living and then the accident my husband had and everything. So uh, my life and my world just surrounded my family and that was it. Now, uh, when you were going to the craft from the house, um, I, I've, I've always wanted to ask you this question. Were you walking? Were they guiding you or were they dragging you? No, it seemed as if now at that particular time I moved in back up the leader and we just moved along. I was like just floating along with him. And uh, like I said, were you uh, were you walking? Were your feet on the ground? I don't think they were. No. Yeah. I, exactly. Right. No. Yeah. That happened a lot. They had control of my movement uh, as far as uh, moving about. Once in a great while, I would be able to uh, feel my feet on the ground, but very seldom. It seemed like I was just. You know, pulled along. And I know you, you always describe the communication as telepathy, which I totally understand. But were you uh, communicating back with your mind or were you speaking out loud? Mm, I was trying to understand everything that was happening. I, I couldn't believe, you know, what I was going through or sure. why I was going through it, you know. I, everything was just a surprise and a, sometimes a shock to me. Like when he, when then afterwards, when they took me out of there, uh, and I was put back in my clothes and went into another cylindrical, uh, like a Quonset hut type room. There were eight chairs there, was set in one, and, and liquid filled uh, the chair. I don't know if I was transported someplace at that time or what. Some of the investigators thought that's probably what had happened. And then they took me out after I they the thing went down the water liquid whatever it was went down and then I was dried like in another chair and the thing is, is then 
two of the beings came in and they were small, a little bit smaller. One was in front of me, one was in back of me, and we were on this uh, black track that went in the center of this Quonset hut type room. And I was just moving along with them. And on this uh, track, or else the track was moving, I don't know now. I, I may have been floating over it, but I think I was on the track with them on the track. And we're moving through this Quonset hut type room, and uh, we're, we went into, like, a, out the door and into a, a cave, a black cave. Now, the, the two beings, one in front and one in back, had silver suits. And uh, when we got in there, they put these black hoods over their heads, and I didn't know why, uh, but it seemed as if all I saw was their bodies, the silver suits, and I guess it was because the black was, you know, went right in with the the way the long cave was as we moved along. Right. And it looked like there were some entrances on the sides because it got darker on certain areas if there were entrances, but I couldn't see anything there. And we kept on going, and it came up ahead, and we went through, like, the mirror, uh, like a... It looked like a mirror. Uh, I think that was either before or after. Sometimes I get confused because so much happened. Right. When entered uh, a red atmosphere, it was bright red. And in here, we're still on the track moving along. And there's these creatures crawling all over this, these buildings. There are a couple of buildings. There's no vegetation there. Uh, and they sort of look like, um, oh, I, it's hard to explain. They had two uh, long necks with eyeballs on the end of them. And they sort of look like uh, lemurs. Yeah, like lemurs, I guess that's what the, 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 uh, the investigators thought. They it, were, it, like, it was they were crawling all over everything. It was at this point in the book um, that I felt uh, that this this uh, journey on the conveyor belt lasted a long time, and it, it is a big chunk of the book. It's a big part of it, and mm-hmm. and that this uh, and your description in the book was very vivid about looking to the left and looking to the right, and you were being shown things, and it yep. just seemed like uh, almost dreamlike, if you will, Betty. And uh-huh. you would you just went on this uh, this conveyor belt, uh, you know, this walkway thing, moving sidewalk uh-huh. for a long, long time. Uh, and, it, yeah. and you were looking to the left and looking to the right and you're describing these vivid uh, scenes as you went along. And it, uh-huh. it, in the book, it, 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 it comes across like they were showing you their world. And I think they were, yes. And and how long do you think? Uh, obviously, your uh, your concept of time is is a little bit strange yeah. at this point. But oh. how long do you think you were on the conveyor belt? Oh, I have no idea. Uh, we when we moved through, uh, there was this whirling uh, reddish light, and that turned there was green mixed in with it, whirling round and round. And we went right through that. It was like a door, an opening, and we went into. Uh, a huge, huge area, a uh, green atmosphere, and I could look down below, and I could see it was a huge, almost like an ocean of green water was all around. And I'm looking down, we're just moving along, and uh, as we're moving along, I looked at quite a distance. I looked off to the left-hand side, and I saw a city of domes and um, uh, like long thing, tall things with pinnacles like on them. And there were those tracks running through uh, this city, just like what we were on. And as we moved along, I could see all of this uh, in this area. It was huge. It was like I was out in space somewhere. I, I don't know exactly where it was, but the green atmosphere that was there, And as we moved along, we kept going, and I looked off to the side, to the left, where the big city was, and as we passed that, I saw this um, three-sided pyramid with a head on the top of it, and the head looks like 
an Egyptian headdress on a man's head. It was like on top of the three-sided pyramid. But the body of the pyramid was straight in front, and then it went back in sort of a point, like a pyramid, but an elongated part to the back, and it indented slightly in those elongated parts. You know, I can say it, but it's hard to picture what I'm saying, I know. Oh and no, I'm right with you, Betty. Don't okay. even don't even go there. Okay. Uh, this is well, wonderful. The, what was so strange was um you know, after everything had happened and everything, somebody sent me a um a magazine and there was a face on the magazine and I nearly flipped out. It looked exactly like what I had seen. And it was supposed to be on Mars. It was that face. Uh, oh, Sidonia, really? Yes, yeah, yes. It looked identical. Did you ever feel, uh, I know this is a strange question, but it's me and you and Bob. We're all alone. Okay, it's just us here. Did uh-huh. you, did you, would you want to live there? I mean, did it look cool? No, it's too strange for Too me. strange? Too strange yeah. for you? I mean, too unusual. Uh, I don't know. Too unusual. Too odd for the kind of life I was living with my family, my children, you know, and just trying to get by and and reading the Word of God and stuff like that. It was just very strange. And uh, now, well, I can't say it wasn't beautiful because it was beautiful. Right, right, right. And as we continued on this, uh, what happened was we came to brighter light, and then I saw something so magnificent just hanging in air and floating and moving. And it was crystals of all different colors who were beautiful, beautiful, with light shining through it. It was just absolutely gorgeous. And we're just hanging in midair there. It was like I was, you know, seeing a fantastically huge, humongous show of, of this place wherever it was at that time. And we're moving along this track, and we keep on moving, and up ahead, bright, bright light was shining, and we're still moving up ahead, and then the beam stopped, and they took off their hoods, and then we continued on a little bit more, and they said, I would have to go by myself, so... I was just moving on the track, and up ahead was this huge, I mean, you know, it makes you think you're a little bug compared (laughs) to what I saw. Right, right. (laughs) And it's a huge eagle, a beautiful, beautiful, huge eagle, and it has its wings down, like, you know, out and down, and I saw the feathers were fluttering all underneath of its uh, wings. And there's this white, bright light, streams of light coming out from in back of this eagle. I know it sounds, it sounds weird and fantastic. It was fantastic. But, I mean, you think to try and see that in life today, you know, with us just right where we are right now. Right. You think, how is that possible? But it was, it, it was, it was just immense. And then, all of a sudden, they're off to the side. Uh, what happened was uh, that suddenly that bright light was getting so hot, I saw sparks flying all around. And it just got hotter and hotter. And I think I must have either passed out or something because I don't recall except seeing a, a pile of gray burning ashes and I mean, these uh, these things that I saw are ridiculous. I, I, I even try and understand it in my mind, but a gray worm came out of the ashes. And then off to the other side where the bright, bright white light was, I heard my name called, and they and the name said called Betty twice. And I didn't know... 
uh, what to do, you know, as it called. And I heard the voice. It was like a multiple voice again, like that multiple voice I heard a little bit when I was little, at seven years old, that multi- uh, many voices within that one. Right. And, and it, like, it, a, like a chorus. Yeah. Yeah, yes, all yes. saying the same thing, but you can almost hear that there's many more there in it. Is this when you had to change your shoes? What? Is this when you had to change your shoes? No. Okay. No. Oh, yeah, there was a, a point at a time that I, I did have, uh, I was taken into a crystal area to see the one, but that was not the, that was not the 1967 encounter. Okay. That was with, that was where, well, what happened then with that light when it called my name twice, the voice said, you have seen and you have heard. Do you understand? And I said, no, I don't understand. I don't even know why I am here. And I started crying. And yeah, why, why would you? And I'm serious, too. I mean, why would you understand? You're in a completely... Uh, for the lack of a better word, alien world. You have no idea, no concept. And so what did you say? Did you ask him, what am I supposed to understand? Yeah, well, uh, they said, if you have seen and you have heard, do you understand? And I said, no, I don't understand. I don't even understand why I'm here. <laughs> right. Exactly. I need some and clarification. Then the voice said yes. To me, the strange thing the voice said to me, I, I, I'm thinking it's something with God uh, that is involved here. Sure, why not? Because I heard it say, um, I have chosen you to show the world. And ever since receiving that word of responsibility, I'm getting goosebumps all over me right now, but after receiving that uh that that was something that I'm supposed to do. And I've had some peculiar things, as you will read in the new book, that has happened to us and happened to me. Uh, that in the future, I think there is something I'm going to have to do. I don't know what it is, you know, and I don't know why me, uh, you know, but why even I was taken way here to see this in 1967. And for that voice to tell me that I was chosen to show the world whatever it is, I thought, well, maybe it's, that's why when I went on tour, you know, or, or television or radio, it was, uh, it was to let people uh, know, uh, you know, that the UFOs exist and so forth. And I, I went all through this and, and I lived through it. So if they have a sighting or if they have had to go through certain things, they, they'll be able to live through it, too, uh, not to be afraid, you know. So anyway, after that, uh, I was taken back and, you know, taken through the same area. I saw the, the crystals and the three-sided pyramid and the ocean below, green ocean, and then the off to the right-hand side going back, I saw the city again, and then I was taken um, into uh, like a, a swirling area of green and red, and taken through the red area where those strange creatures were, and uh, then taken back uh, to the craft and, and, and back home. But I mean, there's a lot more in there that happened, but the, it will all explain in the, uh, the Andreas Nassir book uh, so that people want to know every little detail of it. By reading it, they'll be able to see exactly what has happened. I mean, I can explain it, but you're not going to understand until you really, you feel it. You'll feel it. I did many yeah. times. And you're exactly right, though. You're, you know, it's it's one thing to to uh, uh, let you relive it here and describe it, but the book is such an excellent read, mm-hmm. and you know, and I would suggest everybody read it at night <laughs> in a dark room with your little light on your nightstand and your blankie <laughs> up to your neck. <laughs> oh, and but... If if they are there with you, you will live through it. Yes, I, you uh, will. Yes, absolutely <laughs> will. 
Um, and even if you pick it up with your spirit, like you have, Jimmy. <laughs> it was an epiphany for me, Betty. It, oh, it, it God bless you. That's wonderful. It changed my life. And, and oh, I have been asked, I've done interviews and people ask me all the, you know, Jimmy, how did you get into this? How did you get into this, man? How, I'm sorry, you know, Jimmy. <laughs> and then I always go, man, yeah, talk to Betty. You know, <laughs> talk to Betty. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know, no, no, I thank you I so know much. This. People all over the world have written to me and everything. And, I, you know, I try, in the past, I tried to send letters to them. And this was before the computers and everything. I tried to explain what happened and what may be, be happening to them or whatever. And, you know, it got so to do so much. I just couldn't handle all of it, you know. And even today, there's a lot on the computer I'm not a, I'm, I'm kind of computer illiterate. I only use it for like a typewriter. Sure. Uh, Bob is the expert in there. And so on the Facebook and everything, a lot of people will ask questions because they want answers. And I don't blame them. I want answers myself. All I can do is tell them what I think, you know. But I, I, I can't continue like that because I, I have a life I've got to live. <laughs> Well, well, you know, it's my prediction. Uh, well, actually, I did a prediction earlier today with Bob, and I'm going to reveal that to everybody here in just a second. It, what I think is uh, what was in that blue book is going to come back to you. I think mm-hmm. you're going to probably get that blue book back somehow, mm-hmm. and 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 then then we'll all understand, and, and so will you. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now, my prediction with Bob earlier today was I said, Bob, now check this out. We're going to get started tonight and we're going to go left. We're going to take a right turn, a left turn, a right turn. And the next thing you know, (laughs) we're going to run out of time and and we're just going to have to deal with it. And Bob, uh, you know, we've got another hour left, but here we are. Yeah, I I said to Bob, we're going to run out of time and. And uh, and sure enough, uh, we're not out of time yet. We have a lot more to discover tonight. Right, but, and uh, I think really it would be great with Bob telling you what he has had to go through. Yeah, and, and uh, so, you know we've had such synchronistic things happen to us. We both had uh, an experience as children at uh, in 1944. We both had an experience in 1967. And then in 1978, we, the whole fam- the family was taken up. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Yeah. It, yeah. yeah there, I the, mean, it, how it, it all happened. I mean, and even how I met Bob and everything. So it's all in the new book that we'll be putting out. Well, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, this is, uh, let's do this. Um, we'll be up against a break in about, uh, in about 10 minutes or so. So, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll let, uh, Bob, uh, carry the rest of the show and go out. So, uh, okay. so let's finish up with you, Betty, really quick. And then, and then we'll let Bob, uh, take, a, uh, take, uh, get in the hot seat, if you will. Um, okay. So what, what, uh, as, 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 uh, as, uh, things were, as you were going back, as you were going back, mm-hmm. take us through there because I want to get back to the house and, and then what, uh, the, what the family went through the next day. So let's, let's actually do that. So now you're going back and, yeah. uh, and, and, and let's pick up there. Okay, well, then I was taken back uh, into the red atmosphere where the red creatures were, and uh, through there we went into the quantum, well, first we went through that tunnel, uh, uh, the dark tunnel, and uh, evidently, oh, this is something I I didn't tell you, was I think the uh, beings had to wear those black hoods uh, while they were... uh, close to those red creatures and I didn't know why until later on other things happened and I understand now but uh, anyway they took off the hoods we went into the Quonset hut uh, room they sat me in the first seat to the left there and I think I got a shock of some kind it felt like there was some metal on the on the armatures of that chair it, but they looked like a uh, glass or uh, I don't know if it was plastic. I don't think it was that. Probably a glass, it felt more like. And my arm went down. I could feel a shock. And they, they, they also checked my eyes. Uh, and then after that, I was taken uh, over and uh, 
it, taken out of the air and and brought back home. <laughs> Uh, I've forgotten what happened to me. <laughs> I've, was, I've gone through so much in my lifetime. I'm telling you, I, it's like living a thousand years. But uh, yeah, it was then brought back to the house. And uh, now this is okay. These are some questions. Again, I've got a whole okay. list in my mind uh, that I've always wanted to ask you over yeah. the years. So I don't. I don't want to forget. And this is another one. Um, they five, five, a group showed up, but did, did somebody stay behind with your family? Uh, were they being babysat? I think it was the one that was over by my father. Oh, so one did stay behind to make yes, sure that it, everybody it, behaved. When we, when we came back into the house, uh, into the other room, there was still a being there, and evidently it was the one that was left with my father. Because, yeah, my father was back in the living room at that time, and it was time to put everybody back to bed or to bed or something uh, for us to forget, you know, what happened. They, they had a, a green candle in their hand, and it was lit, the one there. I can't. You know, I've gone through so many things and everything. It's hard to remember, but I didn't, couldn't understand why was that green candle in the hand burning? You know, a fire in it. And uh, did you and own then, a green candle? Where, no. Yeah, yeah. I always wondered about that. No, I didn't. It was a thick green candle, and he was just holding it in his hand, and the fire was. Uh, burning in the candle and then they escorted everyone each one to bed but uh where they would be sleeping you know to the upstairs and into uh my bedroom and everything and and that's and and i know you've talked about this before but the the journey on the moving sidewalk and the experience and 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 everything that you went through must have it it sounded like days you know it sounded like it was just the longest experience right but time is not that way with them uh time is different with them than our time yeah and so how much time went by on on the clocks in the house were you gone for oh, five I minutes have, I, I i have no idea how much time at least i don't recall now how much time but it it seemed quite a while. It seemed like it was a long time that I everything I went through, uh, and then also standing before that eagle and then uh, hearing that voice. It just seemed like a foreverness. I don't know how to. Yeah, exactly. Well, think. you left you left at night. It was dark, and you right. came back. It was still night and dark. It was still right. the same night. Right. Yeah, so it could have been only for your family seconds. It could have been. I don't know. Right, right. Uh, I know it seemed like a really long time with everything that was happening, uh, like I had been away for a week or something. That's right. That's what I was That's exactly where I was going. That's exactly where I was going. I, you know, I didn't think of it uh, as that. I didn't think how long I was. It just... To me, it felt like I was away for a long time, for a week. And I mean, it didn't change anything because my, my parents were still there, my kids were still there, and, you know, and they were uh, putting them to bed. So, I don't know. And the, the, it just is a different time element, I guess. Right, right. And it's different with them than with us. Now, the next day, everybody wakes up. What was that like? Well, the, the the only thing is I knew I had that uh, thin blue book, and I was to be able to look at it. And then, as I said, three days later, I wasn't supposed to show anybody. Three days later, Becky came to me and said, uh, uh, you know, she remembers some strange str- beings, a person being in the house. and And I was afraid, well wow, I better let her know, but I'm not supposed to, you know. And, but she was afraid, and I didn't want her being afraid, and I didn't want her discussing it with, uh, you know, the other kids. Uh, 
so anyways, that's why I decided to show her the thin blue, blue book. You know, too bad in 1967 that we didn't have a Kinko's, a copy that? store. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I would never have done it. I, I, I would have. have. I would have gone straight. <laughs> <laughs> After all of those things, I, I, I don't think I would have. Uh, uh, you know, I think they helped to help me remember a lot of the experience so I could draw it because trying to explain it, it's kind of hard for people to see what I'm trying to tell them, what it looks like, and that's why uh, I think that they gave me that ability to draw the and also being an artist, I mean, you pick up an awful lot more than maybe what another person uh, wouldn't pick up. Because uh, as a child, now I'm going into some of my details of the book, but anyways, as, um, as a child, I loved nature. Uh, I just absolutely loved nature. And when we moved to Westminster, it was like heaven to me. Uh, as you'll read in the Lifting the Veil. Now, Bob found out, though, that there's three other books out there called Lifting the Veil, so we have to come up with probably a little bit different name than that, but that's what I wanted to have uh, as the name, the new book, Lifting the Veil. I was given something in there um, that really surprised me. It's going to be a picture uh, to show something about the one. Um, in the new book. Now, here you are, and we're going to go into the break and we'll come back. Uh, we'll uh, visit with Bob. But, uh, you know, you're just you're just a mom. You know, right. you have a house full of, you know, you're just Ed. a mom. You're t- yeah. and, and you've had to endure not only, uh, for the lack of a better word, celebrity. There's that aspect. Yeah. Um, uh, scary to me. Yeah, you can't control it, but now you're a famous person, uh, but you're just a mom, and and you have to endure questions about who you are, uh, your I, your background, and and you know, it, you know, they're going to take getting looks like yes, oh, oh, yes. that woman crazy, yes, <laughs> <laughs> and and you know exactly what I'm talking about. How yeah. how have you managed? to keep your feet on the ground all these years, because I got to tell you, you're ta- speaking to you directly. You're wonderful. You're open. You're really cool. And, and you know, but, but how did you endure it for, for the last my four faith, years? I mean, it's my faith. Uh, uh, when I was very young, I mean, I found the Lord and I read the word of God. I, I have faith in him and, I think that's what has kept me, really. And I found out, as you will see in the new book, I was given a job to do that I did not realize I was supposed to do. But that will be shown in the new book. Did you ever, uh, I don't know if you've ever answered this question. I know you've always looked at the angel aspect, like Mm -hmm. like all of civilizations have for thousands of years. Yeah. Uh, they were probably seeing E.T., and they called mm. them angels. I, 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 I totally understand that. Did you ever ask them, are you angels? Not that I, I remember asking them. Do you regret I, that? Have, especially the elders at a point. Uh, I, I met the elders, and uh, they, to me, looked like an angel would look like in white robes and very tall, white hair with blue eyes and pale skin. Now that that to me would be more like I would think an uh, angel would be. Uh, so sure. I mean, it was surprising to see gray skin, big black, scary eyes, a big head, and you know, uh, to be an angel. But um, do you look back? That they were uh, keepers of nature in all natural form. In other words, evidently, um, you know, they watched over the planet in some way to make sure that nature would continue. And that's probably why they they probably collected seed, even human seed, you know, sure, sure, to sure. make sure everything would run smoothly because that was their job to do. Now, a lot of people say, well, the watches, you know, the watches were fallen angels. Well, yeah, there were 200 fallen angels that had taken uh, women as wives, 
But that doesn't mean the whole uh, uh, race of watches had fallen. You know, uh, I think Dr. Sitchin had uh, said something about um, the watches coming to the earth and they were with women and that's how they fell and so forth. But could that be. wasn't all the watchers. Right, could be. I mean, uh, do you look back, Betty, is there anything that uh, you uh, regret is the wrong word, but you know how you ask, oh, I should have done this. Oh, I, man, I should have, I, I should have asked, I should have done this. Is there something that uh, you you wanted to maybe have done that you didn't? Maybe ask them a question no, or I, touch I, something or steal no. something? Did You should have grabbed something mm-hmm. off a counter or... No, I never felt that way. I I just felt that God had control of my life, and if this is what I had to go through, that's what I had to do. That's all. Oh, right on, right on. Oh, yeah. this is just great. Let's go ahead and take that break, and uh, when we come back, we'll, uh, we'll put Bob in the hot seat. What do you great. say, Betty? You can take a break. Oh, thank it's you. It's all on Bob <laughs> after this. All right, this is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. Tonight, Betty Andreessen Luca is with us and her husband, Bob. And we'll be back with Bob right after this short break. Stay with us. Thank you, Betty. Stay there. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. Are you a paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, or UFO sky watcher? If so, FNGinnovations.com has the product you definitely need in your investigations kit or go bag. Introducing the Morpholite Wide Beam Tactical Flashlights that put the light where you need it most. Traditional flashlights shine a focused round beam with limited line of sight in the dark. Morpholite Tactical Flashlights change all that, utilizing a revolutionary wide beam design to enable you to see safety hazards such as hanging wires and steel, pipes and holes in the floor you just can't see with a focused round beam. In the field, where safety is paramount, a 180 degree beam increases orientation and peripheral vision in the dark. Morpholite flashlights are ideal for investigations in abandoned facilities such as houses and hospitals, factories, caves and tunnels. Avoid those low hanging tree branches that poke your eyes in the woods. Visit FNGinnovations.com to see a full line of tactical lights and accessories. That's FNGinnovations.com. Now you can find all your favorite talk radio shows live, all in one place at TalkStreamLive.com. Listen from anywhere, office, home, or in your car. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com and click on one of the many live talk show hosts you want to listen to. It's free and easy. No computer? Download the smartphone apps. Never miss your favorite talk show. Find them all at TalkStreamLive.com. Hey everybody, what's up? Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and check this out. The 2015 MUFON Symposium will be held this September 24th through the 27th in beautiful downtown Irvine, California. Expanding ufology, opening new doors in academia, industry, and media, former Defense Minister of Canada Paul Hellyer will be there in person. Former CNN news anchor Cheryl Jones, TV news journalist Jaime Musan and MUFON's chief photo analyst, Mark D'Antonio. They're just a few of the growing list of names for the 2015 event. It's September 24th through the 27th at the beautiful Hotel Irvine. Get your tickets today at MUFONSymposium.com. That's MUFONSymposium.com. Go back, Lee Tepe. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Fade to Black, the spoke 
radio for the masses. I am your oh-so-humble host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, this show is all about me. I needed this. Very special guest, Betty Andreessen Luca and her husband, Bob. Bob, I have to tell you again, uh, thank you so much for this. It, uh, it, uh, it was a long time coming. Uh, for me our too. pleasure indeed oh it's uh it's just just totally awesome so again i've said thank you 20 times right now there's number 21 thank you guys so much <laughs> now uh, and and now bob your story is is it's totally unique uh and separate from betty's but in 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 a lot of aspects it's still the same too as well and True. and before before you met Betty, uh, did you hear about her case? Did you he did you read the book? Did you know anything about her? No, I met Betty in 1977, and that journey, unknown to me, started in 1944. Okay, right. sounds a little strange, but this I feel this was arranged in 1944. During World War II, my dad was overseas. My mom and I were living with my grandmother. My uncles had built me a swing set in the backyard. And as a child, I was out happily swinging away without a care in the world. And I saw a light in the sky that was unusual, even though as a child I knew it, it was something different about it. And this light approached. It came closer and closer, and it stopped to the left of me between an apple tree and my swing set. And it came down low. It was a typical saucer-shaped object with a glass or plexiglass dome or whatever, for lack of understanding. Inside this thing were two what I called little people at the time. As this thing approached, just as it stopped, it shone a very thin white beam of light right which struck me right in the forehead and it was about the thickness of a pencil lead now I got paralyzed um, I could not move I had a almost a slight feeling um, like an electric shock maybe but mild and I could not move from that swing set the people inside with little people as I called them told me at the time that they were preparing something that would be good for mankind. They also went on to say that people like me who had seen them, and they, they said they had seen many, many people um, apparently around the world, which I didn't understand at that time, but they said that these people would meet in the future and would not be fearful, which turned out to be true. Now, you know, this is just a story, okay? Yeah, it's a strange well, thing to say to such a young man. Right. Uh, yeah, did, did you, well, you understood the words, but did you have any concept of what they were trying to, were they able to get the feeling of what they were trying to say across to you? or? I had a little idea about doing something that was good for mankind, but my confirmation came later. For one thing, during World War II, everybody had a victory garden. Right, now, right, right. where this right. thing had hovered, uh, nothing would grow anymore. There, there was a circular pattern right in the garden where nothing would grow. And I have one of my cousins that's still alive today still remembers that distinctly. But later on, years later, when I uh, underwent hypnosis, they brought in a... Um, um, woman that did psychometry and uh she was a psychic but she was very good she had been also she'd been hired by the government to track russian subs before we had all the uh satellites and whatnot she worked with the police department and the state police in connecticut and she described to me she took my jackknife and she described to me exactly what happened in detail and she said uh in the backyard on the left, I see the pipes and vines. So I said, oh, well, here's something wrong here. This was the first time I met her. I said, there's no pipes and vines there. Right. Later on, when I had talked to my parents, 
I was told, yes, my grandfather had put up a pipe arbor and there were grapevines in the yard. Now, I didn't even remember that. And yet this psychic come, comes out with that. So it, that was a little bit of confirmation for what happened in 1944. And moving along, 1967, again, the same year as Betty, I'm driving along on my way to the beach, beautiful sunny day, and I came to um, an area known as a trap rock. I was a quarry, and there was a railroad spur that went into that uh, trap rock. How old? Are, hey, Bob. Uh, how How old were you in 1967? I would have been uh, what 27, 28. Which means you were driving a really cool car. What were you driving? I was driving a two door. Cadillac that had been souped up, nose decked and all. I was a gearhead. That's what I'm talking about. I just wanted to get that out <laughs> in the open. Okay. All right. So okay. 27 years old, two door coupe Cadillac, uh, uh, built to go. And, exactly. Okay. All right. So as I come along with this railroad spur, there's, there's five guys working on it, but nobody's working. They're all looking up in the sky. So that takes my curiosity. And I turn and look, and oh my God, there is in the sky two huge cigar-shaped objects, and they are reflecting sunlight like highly polished chrome. I mean, just brilliant. Now, I'd always been interested in anything that went and anything that went fast, cars, boats, airplanes, whatever. Sure. So I pulled over. Now, anyone can tell these are not airplanes. There are no wings no tail section, no exhaust, no noise, and they're just drifting along from where I was. They were headed toward New Haven, Connecticut. So they were, watching, it was a fuselage without wings. They were tubular shaped. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. Your classic Fair. cigar shape, uh, tubular shaped craft. Right. And they're, they're flying along together. And I'm, I'm watching, thinking, wow, whatever this is, this is, you know, this is a highly unusual. Well, then out of those two craft, one saucer-shaped craft dropped out of each one. One of them went off toward New Haven, and the other one went off in the totally opposite direction. So I'm kind of amazed. I, I sat there until I, everything was out of sight. They're gone, and I said, okay, I'm going to continue my way to the beach. And it's, it's about 11 o'clock in the morning or so at this time. I get down the road a few miles, and it's a very rural area at that time. There were no houses right in that particular area. And one of these saucer-shaped objects comes back, and it's on the left-hand side of the road. There was a pasture, and this thing comes settling down like a falling leaf motion, like rocking from side to side. It's several feet off the ground and just stops right in midair. Well, I turn and I just stared at this thing, and all of a sudden, there was an extremely brilliant blast of red light. The only thing I could compare it to would be like a ruby red, uh, ruby rod laser, the very, very dense red. Yeah, deep red, thick red, red blood red. Yeah, and next thing I know, I'm inside this thing. And I have, you know, it's kind of mind-blowing. It's almost like being transported instantly. There's one of these little gray guys behind me. They were very similar to what Betty had seen, but the uniforms that mine had were skin-tight. They were red, and they had a lightning bolt emblem on the left side of the chest. Um, the four other beings came into the room, I was asked mentally to remove my clothing, and which I did because, quite frankly, I was scared crapless. Right, right. Which I hate to admit, but hey, that's hey, how Bob, it was. Hey, Bob, I want to jump in real quick. Uh, Betty had always described, uh, you know, seeing emblems on the uniforms too. Were, were the were they the same lightning bolts? No, hers were like a bird, like an eagle. Oh, that's and right. It, that's right. It was that's on the on the shoulder. Sure. And mine was on right on the left side of the chest. Right, right. And right. a lightning bolt. Well, they, I was put on a table that, I, again, I can only compare it to plexiglass um, because I don't know what it really was. And I was given a, a physical, I guess, 
they took scrapings of uh, uh, skin, uh, fingernails. They rotated uh, uh, my ankle joints, and uh, they moved my head in different directions. Now, I could move my eyes, and I had a slight movement on my own of my head, but I was... It was almost like somebody put super glue on my back. There were no restraints on that table, and yet I could not move. And, you know, I was fearful, and they, they told me that not to be frightened. They're not going to hurt me. They said they actually said we're not, you won't be hurt. And I'm thinking, yeah, you're not going to hurt me, but here I am stuck here. And to this day, I've got a little bit of cla- uh, claustrophobia from that from since that time. Would you say it was a paralysis-ish? No, it didn't feel like paralysis. It felt like I was just strapped to that table, but there was I could see nothing that was, you know, nothing visible anyway that I could see holding me there. Yeah, interesting. And um, now the, the last thing I remember, they did it. They had a, I can only compare it again to an X-ray machine. It came down out of the the, the top part, uh, the ceiling area, and scanned my body several times back and forth. Uh, they took a sample of sperm and not in a very pleasurable way. And then somehow I got back in my car. Now I get to the beach. Remember, this is 11 o'clock in the morning. Were you dressed, uh, when you went back to the car, you were back in your clothes? Yes. Okay. Um, now when I got to the beach, it was like two and a half to three hours gone. The beach should have been typically a 30 to 40 minute ride from where I was. And I really, for years, I didn't have an idea of where that time was. My physical memory stopped with the flash of red light. Right, right. So when uh, I finally underwent hypnosis, that's when, when the rest came out. But here's where the story gets a little weird. I was always a hard worker and... Uh, I put in a lot of hours, and I was very good at what I did, is, which uh, as a young fellow, I used to, I built race cars, and I, I was a street racer because there's no uh, there were no racetracks anywhere near where I lived. So that's what I did. I was a hell raiser, unlike, you know, Betty, who studied the, the scriptures for a good part of her life. Opposites so attract, Bob. Opposites absolutely. attract. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, this would come in handy later on, as you'll see. But... <clears throat> In 1977, I was a service manager for a new car dealership, and I was a single guy. I was making good money. I got a new demo every three months. I mean, you know, life life was good. And a friend of mine said, Bob, he said, I'm thinking of looking for work elsewhere. I'd maybe like to take a trip around the country and consider moving. So he said, would you like to go? I said, yeah, why not? So we started talking about it and it was going to be a long trip. So I went into my boss and I said, I, I need a month off. Well, <laughs> I won't tell you exactly what he said, but he wasn't much for giving me a month off. Mm-hmm. So I went home, thought about it over the weekend. I went in Monday and his name was Bob too. And I said, Bob, I said, you can, you can give me a month off. I said, I can quit or you can fire me but I'm going. Now, this is very unlike me. I liked my job. I liked making the money I was making, but I just felt like I I needed to take this trip. So we pack up a camp trailer and whatnot, and Eddie and I take off, and we've been down through Texas and and California and Oregon, and we're headed back along the northern tier of the country. We were going back to Connecticut. Weren't you in, like, Idaho or something? Right, right. And we decided at a rest area, for some reason, we're going to Florida. Now, this is several thousand miles out of our way. Yeah, Idaho to, Idaho to Florida or to South Florida, Dakota. Florida, back to Connecticut. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> okay. So we get there, and my friend Eddie has a uh, sister-in-law down there. We go to our house, and we're able to park our trailer on our property. And one evening during supper, she started talking about uh, the UFO phenomena and that she worked with someone that had this UFO experience. And I said, wow, I said, I'd love to talk to this person because I only told my parents and my very best friend who was a police officer because in 1967, 
I was a little concerned about being put in a, you know, either in an asylum or brought to a psychiatrist or whatever. So I didn't tell anybody else. Yeah, and, and at thought, that at that point, I'm sorry, did I just cut you off? I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Okay. At that time, you didn't remember anything but the sighting itself and the and the five workers on the train tracks. So right, well, you, I, you, everything I remember the craft, the two craft uh, cylinder shaped ones. And the two small saucer ones, I remembered everything right up until that red light hit me. Exactly. So you knew you had a sighting. Right. And you hear right. about this young lady, her name's Betty, and she is also uh, has an experience. So, right. So, so I want to talk to her. Exactly. Okay. Here's, here's somebody I can talk to that, you know, isn't going to make fun or whatever. Right, right. So I go down to where she's working, and unfortunately, Ray Fowler had told her, Beware of reporters. Don't talk to anybody. So she won't talk to me. <laughs> so I said, oh, God, what am I going to do now? So I, I was very persistent, and I finally convinced her that I was not a reporter. I convinced her that, uh, you know, I, I would really like to take her out for lunch the next day so we could talk. Next day, finally, I did get to take her out for lunch, and I've been buying that lunch ever since. <laughs> well, it, it, and you know, and she she's a beautiful woman today, but back then, uh, you know, she probably has guys like you asking her out all the time, too. There's that aspect of it. Oh, and, absolutely. Right, and right, right. When right. I went when I went to where she worked, there was two guys there that I did one of them wanted to date her and man, he was staring at me. We had a staring contest. I thought we were gonna end up going outside or something. <laughs> uh, to have at it, but uh, and then she had a date with a police officer, and see, I'm a kind of a persistent guy, so she said, you know, I got this date, I already made it, and I said, you don't want to go out with him, you know that, right. so I just told her straight out, so she did not end up going out with him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was the, that was the beginning. So tell me about your first date. What did you guys talk about? Uh, would you believe UFOs? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm going out on a limb here. <laughs> and and, and uh, how how did that conversation go? Was she relieved too? And and uh, were you guys just getting getting things out? Yeah, uh, it was it was kind of back and forth. And it, you know, it it just to me, it just felt so good to talk to somebody that understood what the emotional part, what I was feeling as well. Not 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 just the experience, but the the emotions that you get all knotted up in you when something like that happens. It's traumatic. I mean, it, re it really is a traumatic experience. And so we, you know, we, we hit it off right away and started dating. And then uh, finally in 77, uh, by gosh, we came back to Connecticut. We were dating. She was living in Massachusetts, so I'd drive up on the weekend. And then uh, finally, when I convinced her that also that she should marry me as well, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we got married and moved uh, to Connecticut uh, near my job. And when the first book was almost ready to be published that's when the stuff hit the fan for all of us we we moved into a house and suddenly we had these helicopters flying over but they weren't normal they were totally black they were military and it got to the point where one of our neighbors who was a city councilwoman started to document the times of these flights because they were so low they'd rattle the windows on the house. And I sent photos of them to Ray Fowler and he said, well, you're, you're probably just in a flight path or whatever. I said, well, I don't think so. So um, I'll, I'll shorten that up. They, the flights continued until we moved within a year, we moved to another town to Cheshire, Connecticut. When we got to Cheshire, Connecticut, uh, by that time, the book was out. Um, we were doing a lot of TV and radio, and there were newspaper articles and all. Now these helicopters were coming over on a regular basis, and I mean regular basis, several times a week. And I took many, many photographs, and I tried to track them down. I contacted the Federal Aviation Administration, the Air Force, the Army, the helicopter manufacturers. And what the FAA told me is, well, I, and I sent them in some good quality pictures, and they said, well, we can't identify them because they don't have any ID, any uh, identification numbers. 
I said, well, that's why I was writing you people in the first place. Yeah, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And <clears throat> it, it, it just got really irritating. I caught one that came over our house. I happened to be up on the roof because uh, not that I sat there often, but I was putting shingles on the roof. And along comes this um, Blackhawk, which they were fairly new at that time, around 1982. Not a mark on it. The windows were blacked out and all. So I got a couple of really good pictures. And I knew when he, when he turned and went away from us, I knew he was headed towards Sikorsky aircraft. So I, called the t- I got off the roof. I called the tower right away. And I said, do you have a large black helicopter in this area? And the guy said, yes, it's an Army helicopter. I said, thank you. And then I wrote and filed a formal complaint with Sikorsky for the low overflight of the helicopter. I had the time, the date, the compass heading, and all that. Yeah, FAA rules are 500 feet. Right. They have to be 500 feet laterally between any buildings. Well, this wasn't the case. I took photos of it almost from directly underneath. But here's the interesting thing. The, the Sikorsky writes me back, and they apologize for the low overflight of the Navy helicopter. Interesting. So I wrote him back. I said, wait a minute. The tower told me that was an Army helicopter. They write back again. It's all so sorry. It was an Army helicopter being flown by a Navy acceptance crew. Well, the Navy does not accept helicopters for the Army. I'm sorry. But that was just one incident. I had a fellow at the FAA told me, he said, these, if there's no markings on it, he says, this is either a CIA operation or a special ops helicopter. And okay. this is, this is the part when, when, uh, you know, when situations like this happen that, that anger me the most, it's, it's just another example of, you know, here comes the government, they're going to do what they can to influence you to, you know, hopefully shut up. Yeah, but that didn't work. You're right, exactly. <laughs> Intimidate you in some way mm-hmm. uh, to keep your story quiet. And and there's not a whole lot that you can do because they're just going to go into the path of denial. Denial, right. you know, they're not doing this. And is that, what you, is that what you were experiencing? Yeah, but it gets even better. Uh, one of the, I, I took, as I said, many pictures. So I took one of the pictures and I sent it to Bell Helicopter in Texas, who makes the Huey UH-1. Right. And I said, you know, what is this helicopter? Why does it look the way it does? And uh, the person I contacted was public relations, a man named Dick Kipton. And he wrote me back a nice letter. And he said that this particular helicopter was a UH-1F-1. BF. He said, but it never left uh, Bell helicopter in this configuration. This helicopter was modified by the Air Force for psychological warfare during the Vietnam era. So why do we have that type of helicopter circling over Betty and I? In, inside the United States. Yes. Now, here's where we have some fun. I, I have a sense of humor. If you, if you knew me, I mean, I, I can make fun out of most anything. I had a friend that was in the military, and we got to talking, and he says, Bob, I can build you an exact replica of a surface-to-air missile. I said, okay, let's have at it. Well, he did, and it was a beauty, okay? Looked just like the real thing. <laughs> oh, no. So my wife and I are home, and we hear a helicopter approaching from the north and low. Now, I know what he would see because I'd flown over the house myself when I was flying. So I knew what he would see and when he would see it. And he's looking for you anyway. Well, that's what we wanted to prove, that he was right. exactly looking for us. So we set this up on a cement pad out in the back of the house. <laughs> he's coming from the north. He's got to clear the peak of the roof before he can see this thing. Well, you hear the Huey's got a very distinctive rotor sound. So the thing is coming along, whop, 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 and he clears the roof. Jimmy, that helicopter went sideways. We were looking at the side. All of a sudden, we were looking at the bottom. He whipped that thing around. I thought the blades were going to bend off on it. <laughs> Took off in the, back to where he came from. I told Betty, I said, you know, I, said, I bet you that fellow's headed back for a shower and a change of clothes. <laughs> and uh, good for I, you. I got nothing against the people that were flying those helicopters because they're just doing what they're told. Sure. You know, they're just following orders. But, I mean, they would show up, 
whether we were in Vermont or New Hampshire, Florida, they followed us. I don't know what technology they used, but they knew where we are, where we were every single moment, and even to the minute of what we were talking about. And I'm, I'll do I have a couple minutes yet? Sure. Uh, well, we're, we're, we're going to take a break in exactly 60 seconds. Okay. Well, uh, right after break, I'll tell you how specific their timing was. And to this day, I don't know how they accomplished what they did in uh, keeping track of us that closely. But it, it's just, it blew my mind, and, and I think you're going to be surprised when I when I tell you, too. Well, you know, when you're flying, uh, like you said, you've flown over your house. When you're flying over, uh, you know, that part of the country, you're looking at trees, you're looking at suburbia, you're looking at houses, and to see you with your, your model kit, right, <laughs> on mm-hmm. the ground, you would have to be looking at that exact moment for that exact place at, at your house because there's too much other stuff to be looking at at that time. He was oh, yeah, looking that's... at your house and he was looking at you to see that and to freak out and to fly away. He was there to check you out and you just proved it. That's, that's what we wanted to do. And, and believe me, there's no doubt in my mind that he was looking in our backyard. That's for sure. Such a, uh, okay, yeah, let's pick up right there when we come back. This is Fade to Black. This will be our last break, and we'll go commercial-free for the last half hour. This is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Betty and Dreesen Luca, her husband, Bob, is with us now. We'll uh, finish the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the show without commercials. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us, Bob. Stay right there. It will be. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. Attention all fade or not. Studio Dome has a special deal on their SD1 Bluetooth speaker. Just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on their banner, enter the promo code Jimmy, and you get $40 off and free shipping on the SD1. It's voice activated. Comes with a USB antenna, cables, and a carry bag. Never listen to your phone, tablet, or laptop speakers ever again. It's the only way to listen to Fade to Black. That's jimmychurchradio.com, Studio Dome banner, promo code Jimmy, Go Beckley Tepe. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. May arrives soon, and with it comes another contact in the desert. So join me in Joshua Tree, California, for the third annual Contact in the Desert Conference being held May 29th through the 31st. 2015 brings another awesome lineup of speakers, including publisher of Legendary Times, Giorgio Sukalos, New York Times bestselling author David Wilcock, journalist and conspiracy expert Jim Mars, former head of UFO Project for the MOD, Nick Pope, investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe, author and contactee Travis Walton, UFO historian Richard Dolan, and many more. You don't want to miss this. Fade to Black and KGRA will be there broadcasting live May 29th. Just visit contactinthedesert.com for tickets and information. That's contactinthedesert.com. This is KJCR at jimmychurchradio.com. All right, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy George. I don't know how that commercial snuck in. Caught me by surprise. Oops. Sorry. This is Fade to Black. All right. Bob, are you still with us? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, I just played a Contact in the Desert commercial that took place last weekend. I have no idea how that snuck in there. It's yeah, in, I noticed that. It's in the playlist. <laughs> 
and uh, we didn't pull it out. Anyway, sorry about that, everybody. It was like deja vu. I was like, didn't we just do that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, uh, yes, uh, uh, let's continue exactly on this path because – uh, the government and and with you and Betty, they start to run some hardcore interference into your lives. And 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 like I said, this is the part that just it, it gets my goat and it's it's almost inevitable. And you guys lived it uh, on, on a daily basis. And uh, so uh, let, let's pick up there. You, you had just said before the break, there was one thing that you wanted to share with us. And, and what what was that? Well, this is this is where it gets weird. For a while, uh, we were doing some private lectures, and we were um, at a home of a an attorney and a psychologist and a group of their friends, and we were doing a lecture. And Betty had just finished talking about her experiences, and I just started. I didn't get two sentences out about the helicopters when all of a sudden you hear the rumble of the rotor blades and a black helicopter goes around the side of the house low and all the people there saw it. Okay. Right. When I had started to talk about the helicopters. So I thought, well, eh, okay. Coincidence. Well, several weeks later, we were in New Britain, Connecticut, uh, doing a lecture for a dentist and a group of his friends. Betty had finished doing her part. I just started to talk about the helicopters. Exact same thing again. The windows start to rattle in the house, and the helicopter passes to the side of the house very low, a black, unmarked helicopter. Well, there's two coincidences. A few weeks later, we were in uh, Meriden, Connecticut, doing a lecture for a contractor and a group of his friends. The exact same thing happens at the exact same time. I mean, it was like I didn't get out two sentences about the helicopters. And what gets me is how the heck I could see if they had our phone bugged, but I don't know how they could tell when we're at somebody else's house exactly when, you know, we're going to start talking about the helicopters. And there were plenty of witnesses in each case. Also, um, fortunately for us, we had a number of witnesses on different occasions. Uh, on one occasion, I was in a, a sporting goods store in Meriden, Connecticut, and I was buying an AR-15. AR I like to the target shoot, and I like to hunt. While I'm in the store, a helicopter, uh, one of the unmarked ones, stops directly over the store and stayed there for the duration of the time I was in, left just before I came out, now, Betty was right parked at the curb in front of the store in the car, and a person across the street who happened to work for the local newspaper also observed this and came over and told her, but he didn't want his, his name used. He didn't, didn't want to be involved. But it's just amazing how they always knew where we were, what time, and even when we went to Florida on vacation, our, uh, we have relatives in Florida, and they'd say, well, they knew when we were in the area because they'd start to see the helicopters. It sounds like they were not only following you so closely, you know, every, you know, every step, every minute of each day, but they were mm -hmm. doing it so closely that the second that you were in somebody's house that they were able to focus microphones on the glass right. and they were exactly. able to monitor the conversations that were going on in the house and then in turn, when you started to talk about these black helicopters, then fly one overhead uh, to, to, you know, some kind of psyops, you know, to mm -hmm. drive you crazy and to make anybody in the room that was there. This is me. This is my observation. But to right, get them right. to think that you were crazy, too, as well, that this was just all coincidence. Right. Well, driving me crazy wouldn't work because I, I was already there. So, <laughs> you know, they had no shot. Right, but right. Also, they had tapped our telephone, and to, as proof of that, uh, I had purchased an electronic tap detector back then because uh, then you could pick up a tap on a line using that device. And our home phone showed a tap. Friends of ours whose phones we tried it on did not. Uh, Betty's phone at work even showed a tap on it. 
So we were we were pretty sure this was the case. And then uh, one evening, Betty and I decided um, we were living in Connecticut. It was winter. About two o'clock in the morning, we decided, "The heck with this! It's cold here. Let's go to Florida." So we get out and we go over to my friend's house, who was kind enough to let me park my travel trailer there. Hooked up the trailer about 3 o'clock in the morning to go off for Florida. This was on a Saturday night, later Sunday morning. And Tuesday, uh, two men with photo ID show up at my job, and they want to know where we are. And, of course, the guys I work with didn't know where we were, so, you know, they didn't get anywhere. But the thing is, we I have several people that have... Um, uh, publicly stated, uh, even in a magazine article, that the FBI was there and that they were looking for me. So when Betty and I got back from Florida and they told us, we went to the FBI building in New Haven, walked in off the street. So this agent really shouldn't have known us. And uh, we said, you know, I understand you're looking for us. What What is it you want? Well, I got the, you know, we can either confirm or deny that uh, uh, we were looking for you and the typical story. So while we're there, I said, well, why are you guys tapping our telephone? And remember, we just walked in off the street. He doesn't know us. He said, well, he said, in our in your case, it's not us. It's Air Force Intelligence. So some months later, I got to talk to someone in Air Force Intelligence, and I was told that, uh-uh, it was not them, that it was the FBI. Um, but I don't. I, I do believe it was Air Force intelligence because uh, I believe in the Betty and Barney Hill case. It was proven to be Air Force intelligence from Pease Air Force Base that had tapped uh, their telephone. Now, in addition to this stuff going on, whenever we went out, we had company. We were followed, and as I mentioned earlier, I used to be a street racer and built my own cars. Well, on several occasions. I got in back of the cars that were following us, and I got the license plate numbers, and I gave them to Police Lieutenant Larry Fawcett, who was also a UFO investigator. When he ran the plates, they came back as unissued. So, you know, it's not your average guy from down the street that's driving the cars with unissued plates. Which is impossible. Right, exactly. Right. Uh, so, what kind of cars were they driving? Do you can you remember? You were a car guy. Uh, actually, uh, they were kind of big. There was uh, Pontiac, uh, Chevrolets, and I think the, one of them was a oh a Buick in uh, Florida. Um, but that's another thing. In in Florida, uh, Betty and I were uh, staying at a campground in Lake Worth, and we <laughs> excuse me, we went over to a laundromat to do our laundry. And this big black Buick pulls in, pulls right up to the door, whips out a camera, takes pictures of us, and takes off. Well, before he got out of the yard, I managed to get out the door and get his license plate, which I gave to Larry Fawcett and turned out, again, to be an unissued plate. But <clears throat> Betty had asked the person there if they were uh, selling the place or if the uh, real estate agent was involved, why this guy was taking pictures. But obviously... It was taking pictures of us, and this had happened from cars, from helicopters. Um, Betty and I were staying at Fort Christmas Campground, which is a beautiful place off of Route 50 in uh, Florida. And <clears throat> there's a lot of trees there, and we got our camper under a little clearing in the trees. And a little two-man observation helicopter comes over and stops right above us. And... He's probably at an altitude of about 75 feet or so. And I can see the guy clearly. He's got a camera. He's taking pictures of us. So I ran in the trailer, and I quick got my camera, and I got two pictures of this guy, one taking pictures of us and the other just as he was leaving. So this is a, a, another form of, of surveillance. Bob, but, did you ever drop your pants and turn around and just show him your backside? Well, no, but I did a lot of times when they crossed over us on the highway low. I gave them, the, I gave them the one finger salute as they were going over, so they get the idea. That, you know, I heard, I heard Betty laugh because it sounded, <laughs> yeah. 
It's, it sounds like you would have, but she stopped you. That's 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 what I'm getting the vibe. Yeah, well, she's a lot more conservative than I am. <laughs> uh, and and but, what what do you do? Um, all kidding aside, let's uh, you know I don't I don't make mean to make fun of this because it just must drive you crazy. But what do you do with your phone conversations if you're constantly thinking in the back of your mind that your phones are tapped? So now you can't be free in your conversation. Maybe you want to talk about, you know, things about life, but you can't because, you know, it it, it must change the conversation. You're not going to have your normal conversation if you know that. Or, you know, hanging out in your backyard or, you know, your 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 private life is completely turned upside down because somebody is watching you 24-7 or listening. What do you do well, about that? See, I'm, like I said, I have a sense of humor. So I would, uh, on occasion, get together with a friend, and we'd rig up a story about some kind of weird technology or something and start talking about it as if it was real on the phone and let them try to figure out what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> uh... So that, uh, you know, that kept it interesting for them. But another one that was, this was funny. Betty and I were in New Hampshire uh, camping at, an Oxbow campground up in New Hampshire. And we were followed in by a black SUV. Well, we were tenting. So we set up our tent and we had a large uh, German shepherd dog that uh, we uh, put a stake in the ground and put him right outside the entrance of the tent. So he was tied right there. Well, the black SUV pulls in across from us, got a space across from us. The guy gets out. Now, First off, the guy's wearing a suit. Most people don't go camping in a suit. Nope. So he gets out and he throws out the tent poles and everything on the ground. And it's getting late. It's almost, it's not quite dark yet, but it's getting there. Well, he tries to set up this tent and he can't. All of a sudden you hear a blue streak of curse words coming from over there. And in the SUV he goes and he slept there all night which I guess he was the guy that was supposed to watch us while we're up, right, <laughs> we're up there. Right. But uh, I did not get his license plate, but uh, I probably should have. But anyway, this, there's just so many things that, that had happened to us over the years that it's hard to, you know, roll it all up together and make sense of it. But the, the worst thing, and I believe yeah, I discussed this with you earlier today, they actually broke into our house in Cheshire, Connecticut. And about two, between two and three in the morning, I heard two men distinctly talking in our kitchen. Now from our, the master bedroom, you went out the door, turned right and you went into the kitchen there. I heard these guys distinctly. And I looked at the foot of the bed that our large dog, our German shepherd got up and his front paws spread apart, and he fell right flat on his face. At that time, I said, well, obviously something's wrong. I reached in my nightstand for where I kept the 38, and I was going to confront these people, and that's the last thing I remember. In the morning, we got up. Betty had a wicked headache. I had a terrible headache. And all day long, she said that her left arm was hurting her, and she's, she's right-handed. All day long at work, my right arm was hurting me. I'm left-handed. We got home and took off our shirts and whatnot, and there was a, in the, uh, about at the bottom of the deltoid, in the area where you'd get a vaccination, mm -hmm. there was a black and blue mark about an inch, inch and a quarter in diameter with a puncture mark right in the center on both of our arms. So I had talked uh, talk to our, our family doctor, and I said, if we went to the hospital and had blood drawn, would, would that, you know, be useful? And he said, no, he said, by that time, there wouldn't, nothing would show up in, uh, in our blood. So unfortunately, you know, we could never really prove that except I had just painted all the trim on that house. And you could see where someone had come in with something, probably uh, thin metal or whatever, and popped the lock open. You could see the paint was skimmed right off the door. So was, um, there, was anything missing from the house? No, but I do have, I was given by accident a tape and on that tape was a meeting of scientists from all over the world. And we were called within 24 hours and asked to return the tape. Well, I did, but I, um, <clears throat> I copied it first and, uh, that might've been what they were looking for. I really don't know. 
Um, the only thing is today, I have no clue where it is. We have hundreds of them, and I'm going to have to look, you know, uh, see if I can find it again. But the other, other one thing I wanted to mention too for your listeners um, on our, our our website, andreasnaffair.com, Betty has drawn everything uh, that she's seen regarding the inside of the craft, the propulsion system, and I've put the government documents and whatnot on there. So if anybody's interested in seeing it, uh, if they want to check out the website, um, they can find all that information up there. Yeah, we've uh, tweeted out uh, those uh, links, and if ever, um, uh, uh, Mark and and everybody in Twitter, if you can go ahead and and uh, retweet those out. I'll retweet those, and we'll get them out there. It's it, andreessonaffair.com. Right, uh, that's perfect. Yeah, we've had, uh, I've been looking at the drawings all night, and they bring back memories, too. Um, what's uh, what's like, um, what's, what's life like for you guys today? Are you still, uh, is it a day-to-day thing uh, being messed with? Have they chilled out? Or, you know, what, what's uh, they, going on? They've chilled out. We're, we're in the country where we are now. But we're still and, having some unusual things happen, yeah, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah there's some unusual things. things. But I, I've, it, the attitude I've got now, I, I, when we were in Florida, I worked for the sheriff's department, and I've got a little different attitude in that today, if somebody comes inside this house by breaking in, you're going to leave either with a cop or in a body bag. <laughs> there's there's, there's going to be no other choice. Well, Betty, uh, Betty just said uh, it's still unusual things. What, what was uh, Betty, what were you referring to? Well, both uh, some of the things that will be in the new book, but I uh, talking about with Bob with the military and everything. Uh, Dr. Heineck uh, came to me once we were at MIT at a lecture there, and I was by myself. Bob was talking with someone else. He rushed up to me quickly, stood before me, and he says, Betty, stick to philosophy and leave the military out of it. Now, he, that was a warning for Bob, and then he took off. That's so, a, a, you know I was trying to warn Bob because Bob has had uh, things come over the computer. He's going to probably tell you about what has happened. These they, uh, they broke broken into his computer and trying to find different. Now things. many many times. But uh, this one particular time, he'll tell you about. Well, the, the the interesting thing isn't that my computer was hacked. It's who hacked it. Uh, the first one was the United States Navy. Space Weapons Division, and within 48 hours, the United States Army. And I had, I have written, I have tried to find out why they did it. Of course, they're not going to tell me. I tried to go through my state senator; he couldn't help me. I contacted the Attorney General of the United States; he referred me to the FBI. I filed a complaint with the FBI. I still have heard absolutely. Nothing. For some reason, they don't want to talk to me. But I'll tell you this. this well, is, uh, Bob, uh, real yeah. quick, uh, I, I don't want to run out of time. Uh, okay. do, do, were you able to get IP addresses and then chase oh, the computer back from there? A- absolutely. And I've got, I've got a letter from the United States uh, Inspector General, the Army Inspector General, admitting it was their computers. Were you able to get an address? Oh, I got the physical street address the whole bit. Did you go on Google Maps and check the building out? No, I haven't done that. Okay, all right. But uh, I'm I, I'm waiting. But I want to tell you, there's something else I'd like to add too. Sure. These, these people, you know, they're they're real good at surveilling you and all that kind of crap. But when you come face to face with them, I called the CIA and I told them I wanted an interview that Betty and I were doing a book. You know, they wouldn't talk to me. I called the the FBI. Betty and I did a series, uh, three part series in the news on television. And I, I mentioned what the FBI had, some things the FBI had done. And they said, and their reply was, well, more or less, you know, that we don't know what we're talking about. I challenged the FBI to do a show with us, not on what happened to us, but on their own documents. Do you think they would show up? Nope. Oh, they didn't. Betty and I went to NASA in Florida. And we talked to the, uh, the uh, guard at, at one of the gates. And we told them we were doing a book and we'd like to interview the administrator. They said, okay. They called down there. The administrator was there. It was a fairly long walk. Well, to make a long story short, I don't know if they recognized us or what, but by the time we got down there, we were met at the door by a secretary who said the administrator wasn't there, and she was visibly nervous. Now, you know, if if these people... 
Why are they afraid to talk with people like we're nobody? We're just we're average working people, really. And yet, when when I want to question them, they won't talk to me. Bob, you I, seem like the kind of guy that would walk up to one of those black sedans and rap on the window. Were you, well, you know, he tried that when I when I was on the radio. <laughs> he went outside, and there were two cars parked out out way uh, in front of our house, but there was a, a slight field, and then the the yard. I mean, the road there with those two cars. He went out there to approach them. They took off. Yeah, they, one was a black Cadillac. It was it was night, and we were doing a radio show, like, much like this, on the phone. And they parked one parked right in front of our house, the other one parked across the street. the The second one wasn't a car; it was a white van, and the first one was a black Cadillac. And I went out there, and I got reasonably close to it. The windows were tinted; I could not see anything inside this car. Nobody moved or anything, and. I thinking about rapping on the window, like you said, I thought, well, I don't want to get myself shot either. So, you know, I thought better of trying to open a door or knock on it or anything, which I probably should have. But at the time, I didn't, and I'll probably regret that. And you asked Betty before if she regretted anything about during her experiences. And, and there's one thing I would change if I could go through it again. I would steal something off that ship. Maybe that's what I would do too. I would. I'd, I'd be a. I'd, I'd be a pocket full guy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I definitely. Thou shalt not steal. Yeah, Betty, and uh, that's fine. <laughs> you know, people. People. The other thing I'd like to bring up because one of the reasons that we do uh, get out as much as we do, and all people should not be fearful. Um, you know, everybody that I know and I've talked to has come back pretty much alive and healthy uh, after being abducted. And truth be known, I, I would rather be abducted again than have a, um, another, uh, oh, what do you call it, on a tooth? Root canal. Yeah, root canal. I, I would rather be abducted again than go through more root canals, put it that way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all in one piece and mentally and physically still in pretty good shape at least i think so mentally a lot of a lot of people contacting us uh you know will tell us about what they have gone through matter of fact uh, the bent waters uh case uh, the young man larry warren uh contacted us it was really strange because we had been on a radio show and he heard it and he had been to the dentist his mouth was swollen out he had cotton in there he got on the telephone he had to call us to see if he could talk to us because of what he went through and he's talking with his mouth you know could barely hear him and i said yeah sure come on over and and we'll talk with you so he came over to our house uh and we went into the living room and he started to talk with bob that's how the bentwater story came out actually we were the first ones to interview um anyone that had been at bentwaters that was back in 82 and I had contacted the British Ministry of Defense, and I still have the letter to this day. They said it never happened. I contacted the U.S. Air Force, and they said that nothing ever happened. They had no reason to investigate. And, of course, today we know that was all a big lie because you've got the deputy base commander with his recordings and right. the other airmen that had seen what went on there. Hey, so, but, hey, but, well, listen, we're, we're out of time, and I, and I, I want to invite you both back. Whenever, uh, well, I, the book will be coming out. Uh, I just want to say this for the last time. Thank you so much. This oh, meant so oh, much to thank me. thank you. You're so welcome. And, and, you are so easy to talk. You've made it so easy for us. Yeah. And I mean, we really enjoyed being on the phone yes, with you. you do Absolutely. A great job. Yeah, thank you so much. And Make us feel very comfortable. God bless you. It, it, we're going to have fun the next time, too. When is yes. the book going to come? Is it well, finished? Right now, it's being looked it's at. It's the publisher right now. Yeah. So it's so. finished, and you're just waiting to get it published. Well, it's not exactly finished. Don't forget, uh, Bob and I are not, um, you know, good at writing, but we wrote down all that had happened and how our life was like and everything. Well, and so we'll need an editor to go through it to make sure it reads right, good. But right. they, so far, they think it reads pretty good. Okay, we've got uh, 30 seconds. Are you guys going to be doing any speaking uh, anytime soon, or are you going to be out there? 
We not, were supposed to, but not not until uh, next year. Um, yeah, we won't much. be seeking anywhere this year. We have too many things have been going on. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. I can't wait to get you back on the show. And okay. this meant this meant so much to me. And it was a very very oh. special evening. I wa- oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you guys. I want you to be safe. And again, I can't wait to get you back on the show. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. okay. Have okay. a we pleasant look forward evening. To it. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Bye bye now. Be safe out there. <laughs> Betty and Bob and Dreesen Luca. That meant so much to me. Thank you so much. This is Fade to Black. I think you guys could tell that was a very, 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 very special evening here on Fade to Black for me. And that's it. I am out of here. This is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. Again, very special thanks, seriously, to Betty Andreessen Luca and Bob Luca, Faded Black's executive producers, Rita Kamarian, shows produced by Hilton J. Palm and Mark D. Kovar, LJ3, Renee, Mark Dunbar, and Jonas. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar, Fady by Dale, Webmaster is Method of Signaling, Music, Doug Aldridge, Intro is Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication is KGRA The Planets. Man, oh man, tomorrow night, Robert Ferrala right here on Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow us on Twitter at Radio. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. I want everybody to be safe. See ya.